In September of 2004, Sucker Punch released Sly 2 Band of Thieves, a follow-up title to their 2002 game, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, and the newest sequel was received very well by both critics and fans. The title took the groundwork laid by Sly 1 and revolutionized it by evolving every single component of the original for the better. From the gameplay to the narrative to most of the presentation, Sly 2 Band of Thieves crushed it and took the series in a new direction, one it wouldn't look back from. Before I lay out my overall thoughts that provided foundation for this massive video, I first want to take a bit of time to go over the logistics. I wouldn't say it's absolutely required or anything like that, but I'd recommend first checking out my 2.5 hour critique of Sly 1 because I will be referencing points I made in that video throughout this one. If you're licking your chops to watch this video, I'm sure you'll have no issue checking out that one as well, given the subject matter. If you've already seen it or simply don't care about it, welcome aboard for this analysis. Just like with my first review, the footage for this video comes from the Sly Remastered Collection on PlayStation 3. I'm playing it on PlayStation 4 Pro though, through the PlayStation Now system, and it's not the greatest for recording purposes. There are a few times when the borders get cut off randomly, but there really isn't much I can do about it except apologize up front for it. Oh, and I also got a lot of random lag spikes, which I really don't remember from the original release on PS2 or playing it in the original collection on PS3. But they did pop up, so it's something to be aware of if you see it in the footage. As I write these opening words, I have no clue how long this video will end up being, but I bet it will be even longer than the first, simply because Sly 2 is a bigger game, both in length as well as complexity in narrative and gameplay. Because of this, I've included timestamps in the description below so that you can jump to different portions of the video. I'm basically going to be going through every mission in the game while simultaneously offering my thoughts on additional features like the music or the lighting or the graphics, the character arcs, the mechanics of each playable character, and so on and so forth. My hope is that this allows me to be as thorough as possible with sharing my complete thoughts on this game. And finally, another piece of information that I feel I must divulge is that Sly 2 Band of Thieves is my favorite video game of all time, and so that inherently comes with a bias that's hard to shake. I'll do my best to stay as objective as possible, but I'll tell you right now, this video is going to be overwhelmingly positive, and for good reason, this game earns that. Hopefully, if you're willing to watch this whole video, you're probably a big fan of the series as well and won't mind my bias as much. Oh, and I guess I should mention this, and I don't even know why I'm saying it because it's so obvious. You're not stupid, you know this. But spoilers ahead for the entirety of Sly 2 and parts of Sly 1. With that, the disclaimer and background stuff is complete, and we can begin. Buckle in, folks. It's going to be a long journey. Just like I did with my Sly 1 video, I want to offer my overall guiding thoughts that fueled the following analysis. I've done my best to condense all my thoughts on the game into three guiding beliefs. One on gameplay, one on narrative, and one on presentation. When it comes to gameplay, Sucker Punch didn't settle for regurgitating the outline that they used in Sly 1, but instead took a bold step forward by blending stealth and combat mechanics into the already existing platforming mechanics to create something new and exciting. When it comes to narrative, the development team decided to mature our characters and give them all a concrete sense of purpose through a story that truly tests their friendship as much as their skill sets, although there are a few hiccups along the way. And finally, when it comes to presentation and game design, Sly 2 Band of Thieves excels furthest in its ability to create a powerful atmosphere that keeps the player on edge while maintaining a somewhat strong original score that was felt throughout the first title. However, its graphics haven't held up quite as well. These are about as boiled down as I can get my overall thoughts, 
And with that, I think we can jump into the meat of this video. So welcome to a slightly long critique of Sly 2 Band of Thieves. While I believe that Sly 2 improves on Sly 1 in almost every single way possible, I'd argue that its tutorial is slightly weaker, albeit its focus is on the narrative instead of gameplay like it was in the first title. It's almost like comparing apples to oranges. In Sly 1, the tutorial mission quickly forced you to learn its core moves, jumping, smacking things with your cane, and performing super stealthy moves. In Sly 2, only two of these things are utilized in the tutorial, jumping and performing super stealthy moves, aka jumping and hitting the circle button. From strictly a gameplay design standpoint, using the cane to hit things will be a core part of the title, and so it seems like something the tutorial should have at least introduced, even if it does just boil down to hitting a single button. That aside though, this tutorial does a lot for the narrative and shows off the core issue that kicks off the entire plot of the game. In Sly 1, we learn about Clockwork, an ancient owl who forged his entire body in metal to achieve immortality. He was fueled to do this out of hatred for Sly's family and spent his entire life trying to outsmart them and destroy them, but always failed to do so. In an attempt to discredit the Cooper's reputation, Clockwork killed Sly's parents and stole the Thievius Raccoonus, an ancient heirloom that outlined all the moves Sly's ancestors had perfected to prove that the Coopers were nothing without their book. Sly of course proves Clockwork wrong by growing up without the book and still becoming a master thief, and he even eventually destroys the Owl. As Sly 1 ends, Clockwork's mangled body parts are strewn all over a body of lava, but his eyes open, hinting at a return. Sly 2's opening mission takes place two years after the events of the first game, and sees the Cooper gang attempting to retrieve the Clockwork parts to destroy them. We are introduced to Sly, Bentley, and Murray fairly quickly, and get some insight on them through their dialogue. Sly is still as calm and cool as he was in the first game, but he's grown, he's more mature, and has taken on a true leadership role. Bentley is antsy, it's his first time out in the field, and he's scared of screwing up and getting caught. For returning fans though, Murray's personality is the most striking. In Sly 1, he was a bit of a scaredy cat and wimp, who eventually discovered his confidence side by helping complete jobs. While that game didn't do a great job of showing Murray's growth, it's clear that the events of that title served as an awakening for Murray as he's now tough and fearless, even if he is still a bit dumb. This gives us a starting baseline for all of our main groupies, and we can see how they change from here throughout the game, some more so than others. Here they all are, robbing a museum, which is one of the most ideal scenarios you'd hope for in a game about thieves, and the atmosphere quickly takes over. As you make your way to the display housing the clockwork parts, Sly discovers they've already been stolen, and returning love interest Carmelita Fox bursts in to catch him red-handed. It's clear she didn't learn much from the first game, as she is still obsessed with capturing Sly, to the point that she ignores other criminals altogether. A new character, Neela, is introduced as an accomplice to Carmelita, and she mentions that all signs point to this being a claw gang job, a hint that Sly quickly picks up on. The distracting bickering gives Sly and the gang a chance to escape and mull over exactly what to do next. It's here where the game gives us the obligatory sequel opening cutscene. We get a recap of who the characters are and the events of the first game before setting up the events of this one. 
It's always good to see developers taking a small amount of time to explain the backstory for those players who are experiencing a sequel as their first title in a series. I know I was grateful for it in 2005, which was the first time I played this game or any of the games. Anyway, the tutorial does its job. We get an introduction to some of the main mechanics and set up the plot. Sly and the gang need to retrieve the clockwork parts to prevent his return and destroy him for good. And with that, we're on to our first real episode of the game. Returning from Sly 1, each chunk of this game is presented episodically where the villain is introduced and the main goal is made clear to the player. In Sly 2, Sly and the gang are trying to recover the clockwork parts that have been distributed amongst the members of the Claw Gang. They learn that the local operator is a lizard called Dimitri, arguably the most iconic Sly villain after Clockwork. He's in possession of the Clockwork tail feathers, and it's up to our crew to recover them. The cutscene wraps up with a title card, and just like I said in the previous video, it's still true, I love these title cards, this setup, and the episodic nature of it all. With that, we're brought to our first stage as Sly dashes across some rooftops to reach the group's safe house. As we exit the safe house, we are immediately prompted on where to go to start our first mission. Before doing that though, it's already time to address the most significant change from Sly 1 in Sly 2, the overall approach to gameplay. Sly 1 was a platformer with some light combat elements, but Sly 2 is much more of an action-adventure game that has stealth, platforming, and combat elements within it. Sly 1 was about creating interesting levels to platform through, but the goal in any level was always the same. Go from point A to point B and collect a key. And more frequently than I would have liked, these platforming levels were broken up by mini-game stages that felt antithetical to the entire experience. Collecting treasure keys was fine for that initial game, but it wouldn't have gone over well in a sequel, because the situations they created felt so contrived. For example, why does Raleigh have a cannon with seven locks on it, with the keys being housed in odd locations, like the inside of a power source, a library, and at the bottom of the sea? Why wouldn't Raleigh just have no keys and never let any outsider have the possibility of stealing them? It doesn't make logical sense, but it was fine for that intro game. Sly 2 elects to forego all of that for a completely different style, and it's for the better. This title wanted to tell a more mature and believable story, one that its gameplay was in service to, and having obvious game structures like treasure keys would have felt very jarring. Instead, Sly 2 features eight different maps, hub worlds essentially, that each contain a large open space as well as a few buildings that can be accessed. Instead of platforming through set levels, this game introduces an organic mission structure where the gang must complete a total of about 8-10 to 10 missions in each chapter. Each mission is about gathering intelligence on the chapter's villain, and then executing on a series of steps to set up one final heist to steal the clockwork part. This system is light years more advanced and well thought out than in Sly 1, where every level's mission was to gather a treasure key, an end goal that gets very repetitive very quickly. Here, every mission is varied in its gameplay, as we will see, and also contributes to a bigger narrative that makes everything you do feel critical to the plot. Your actions in these missions change the course of the story as well as the environment in certain situations. This makes for a more tight-knit experience that ultimately elevates the game to a much higher level than the original, and hopefully I can convey that over the course of this critique. Most of the missions in this opening chapter are about getting a handle on how Sly, Bentley, and Murray control. The opening mission is called Satellite Sabotage and sees Sly prowling the rooftops of Paris in order to reposition satellites to collect information on Dimitri. Its purpose is to be a navigation tutorial for new players, as it teaches them how to move around the open world, scale buildings using the legendary jump-and-hit-the-circle-button moves, 
as well as how to interact with objects and how to ping waypoints to find out where to go next. For veterans, this mission is completed in two minutes or less, so it doesn't feel intrusive, while it does give new players a chance to learn the basics without a ton of pressure. The hardest to defeat guards aren't even introduced yet, and so it's fairly easy to avoid guards altogether. Rerouting each satellite allows for Bentley to start hacking into Dimitri's communications to collect data, and that is a very thiefy thing to do. Immediately following up satellite sabotage, Sly is encouraged to start the next mission, breaking and entering. If the first mission was about giving the player a chance to familiarize themselves with the mini open worlds, this second mission is about introducing the player to combat lightly as well as learning how building interiors function. Alongside of that, this mission introduces the teamwork theme into its gameplay by having you first clear out a room full of guards with Murray. Continuing to succeed and overcoming adversity is made possible throughout this game because our cast of three sticks together no matter what, and it's good to see this manifest in the gameplay by having Bentley, Murray, and Sly working together, whether it be directly like in this mission where you fight together, or indirectly, like when Bentley gives guidance on how to complete a job before you get started with it. The guards are cleared out quickly, and soon we work deeper into Dimitri's HQ. The wine cellar contains an air vent that gives way to the backstage of Dimitri's nightclub, where we get some more practice in combat. The stealth attack is introduced here, and it's a pretty handy tool. If you manage to sneak up on a guard, you can take them out in one hit at the cost of making a loud bang that will alert nearby guards. It works best to take out the bigger flashlight guards and then clean up the smaller guards that are drawn to it. We'll talk about this game's combat in more detail later in the video though. For now, we reach Dimitri's counterfeit operation and it's time to grab some photo reconnaissance. Every new chapter will start this way, by gathering intelligence on the villain, their plan, and how they are using the clockwork part, and I think it's very well done. It just makes sense that the group would need to gather intelligence before planning any sort of heist. On top of that, there's something so sneaky and thiefy feeling about crawling through air vents and going unnoticed as you snap away at the incriminating evidence and its owner. And with that, we head back to the safe house so that Bentley can begin constructing a plan. Now that we've been given ample time to understand how Sly moves and attacks, we're brought to our first real job of the game. It's time for the player to show that they've mastered the basics. Bentley tasks us with swapping out a bug photograph for a real one in Dimitri's office so that we can listen in on his conversations. The catch? Sly cannot take any damage while holding the painting, or else it will bust. This tasks the player with first navigating the world in a stealthy manner and discourages confrontation with flashlight guards. However, once you reach the ballroom, it's practically impossible to avoid combat. Luckily, we're tasked with defeating the smaller guards who don't have projectile attacks that would feel cheap. Sly and the player can handle this combat challenge with ease. When you consider the first and second parts of this mission, it's clear that the game is trying to insinuate that it's best to avoid combat with flashlight guards, but that combat with these smaller foes is much more manageable. It's a good lesson that's taught through gameplay. The rest of this mission is about performing acrobatic feats as Sly in order to reach Dimitri's office where his photo can be replaced with our bugged version. Returning from Sly 1, we get these loudspeaker messages from the boss updating his guards on what's going on. In this one, Dimitri casually mentions how spice sales are up. It's a very forgettable part of the monologue, but it hints at the bigger picture as we will come to see. It's nice to see these villain talks come back though, as they give a little more insight into what's going on. With that, we swap the paintings and the job is complete. But that's not really all there is to do. 
Bentley tells us that if we can get that painting back to the safe house unharmed, he can sell it for coins through the internet. I'll talk about this mechanic more later, but this is a good introduction to it. By the way, a pretty cool detail here is that after Dimitri's office is bugged, you can actually hear him talking to himself in the safe house. Look at this wonderful dark painting. Very good. Next, Bentley has intercepted an email from Dimitri telling his crew to ring his boat's bell when the coast is clear, and tasks Sly with tracking the lizard to see if he can squeeze some information out of him. It's nice to see that the work we did in Satellite Sabotage had a direct impact. We're only able to access Dimitri's emails because of that job. This game does an incredible job of connecting missions to later ones. This was that level that as a child, sold me on this game's atmosphere. Because let me tell you, I was petrified to tell Dimitri and was horrified to get caught. I've played this game so many times that I know his route exactly, but when I was a first time player, I remember studying the environment and his movements to come up with the best way to tail him without being noticed. These missions are excellent by the way, and there are a few times throughout the game when you'll have to do something similar. One of the biggest issues with Sly 1 is that we didn't get enough time with any of the villains in order to truly appreciate them, and it seems Sucker Punch agreed with that sentiment. In the sequel, there are a lot of missions where our characters indirectly observe or deal with the villains so that we can learn more about them and get a better understanding of their personality, and that's something to be praised. The path you must take while following Dimitri is actually quite rigid, and the job will auto-fail if you get too far away from him. I think it's to prevent returning players from running to the endpoint and then waiting. But for new players, the level design encourages a singular path that is easy to navigate. A lot of the rooftops in this hub world are large and take up a lot of space without being very far apart. This means that the player is given a chance to understand how useful rooftop vantage points are before coming chapters will reduce the amount of space given. Eventually, Dimitri ends up at a door where he enters an access code to get inside. Sly is able to get behind the boss undetected to catch the code and memorize it. Bentley comments that this room leads to the water treatment facility and could come in handy for the heist. Our next mission is called Water Pump Destruction, and it marks the first time in the series where Murray becomes a fully playable character. Since it's our first time controlling him, the developers have actually removed all the flashlight guards from the patrol so that we can get a feel for how he plays. It's quickly evident that what Murray lacks in agility and balance, he more than makes up for in raw strength. He's able to defeat small guards in two hits, as well as flashlight guards in like two or three hits. That's a lot better than Sly stats, and light years better than Bentley's. It's very easy to spam the square attacks with Murray to mow through enemies. Like I mentioned, the trade-off is he can't really climb things like Sly, so you'll be spending a lot more time on ground level. Moving on to the actual job now, Bentley tasks us with blowing up the water pump so that the guards will have to redirect the flow of water to the old tower which the gang will later exploit. This mission introduces us to Murray's capabilities. He's good for two main things, defeating guards and throwing objects. First, we have to break through the security system by chucking objects at a computer. This is a nice controlled environment for the player to learn how to do that in, and that's Basic Design 101. Our next job will build on this, and so it's good to see the player given a safe place to learn the mechanic. We're also shown how guards will get knocked out if objects are thrown at them, and how even those very same guards can also be used as projectiles. With that, we're brought face to face with the task at hand, throwing small goons into the water pump to clog it up and destroy it. And hey, don't, don't feel too bad for these rats, they're kind of dicks anyway, so they deserve this deadly bath. It's now time for another slideshow presentation, and I gotta say how much I love these. You truly feel like one of the gang as you listen in on what Bentley needs the group to do next, and what kind of missions you can expect. It's a small way of further immersing the player. 
With a lot of data now on our side, Bentley has formulated a plan of attack, but there's still some more jobs to pull off before we can take a crack at the clockwork tail feathers. Our next Murray mission is an extension of the previous one, as we now must use our newly learned throwing maneuver to demolish some security alarms around the city. The challenge here is that guards will flood in every time an alarm is attacked, and each alarm has to be hit a few times before it breaks. The player must take out the alarms as fast as possible to reduce the amount of guards that will come to investigate. Ultimately, it's not very challenging and wraps up pretty quickly. As we will come to see, even though Murray is so much more fleshed out as a character, his skill set still pales in comparison to that of Sly and Bentley's. Almost all of his missions will boil down to beating up guards or throwing objects. It's fine for what it is, but it means Murray is the least mechanically rich character and can leave him once again feeling a little shallow, just like in Sly 1. Our next task is a doozy, and introduces a pretty important mechanic to the game. Before that though, I decided I'd take some time to talk about the functionality of clue bottles in Sly 2. In Sly 1, each platforming level was home to a series of clue bottles that, once collected, allowed the player to unlock a safe at the end of each level that contained a power-up. They haven't really changed all that much in Sly 2, but their inclusion isn't a bad thing. Each level has 30 clue bottles spread across the map, and since these areas are a lot more open with more nooks and crannies to investigate in, finding them all can be more challenging than in the first game. Luckily, there aren't any tricky ones in Dimitri's world, so I found them all pretty easily. These encourage players to spend a little extra time exploring the map. In fact, when starting the game for the first time, I'd encourage players to search for every clue bottle before starting the first mission within a chapter. This allows you to familiarize yourself a bit with the map first and rewards you with a power-up. Speaking of which, I do grab the power-up here, but I want to talk about them later. Anyway, our next job is called Theater Pickpocketing. That's right folks, it's time to get down and dirty into the world of stealing items right out of bad dude's clothing. The introduction of a pickpocket mechanic was such a natural fit for Sly as a character. He already had the perfect tool for traversal in his cane, why not give it another function? It fits perfectly into our preconceived notion of what thieves do, and it adds another type of gameplay system to craft jobs around. Here, we are tasked with relieving six guards of their keys in order to unlock a control panel granting access to the security system controlling Dimitri's printing press operation. It serves as a solid introduction to the mechanic because every guard's walking path is short and repeated, meaning the player can study them beforehand if they need to. There's something just so satisfying about successfully sneaking up on a guard and robbing them blind while they're completely unaware of it. And the little jingle sound effect we get after each pickpocket solidifies the experience for me. The way he slides animated here, in that crouched way, fits the moment perfectly, and we'll look more at the animation of characters later in the video. This ends up being one of the best jobs within Dimitri's world because it introduces the player to an exciting new mechanic that gets them close to danger with the thrill of getting out undetected. Our next mission is another sly one, and it's a meetup with Constable Neela. Neela is a new character to this game and will have a big impact on it as we will come to see. Unfortunately for her, most of the interesting things she does are completed in the first three out of eight chapters. Her initial impact is strong, but she gets weaker and weaker as a character as the game progresses. For now, she informs Sly that her clogging reference was indeed a tip. She hopes by working with someone on the opposite side of the law, her chances of stopping the clogging will be much easier. As a showing of good faith, she even agrees to help Sly break into Dimitri's nightclub, but it comes with a catch. She needs you to keep up with her. Literally. That's right, this mission is simply about following Neela as she quickly and inefficiently moves around the map. Hey, I never said that every single job was contextualized perfectly in its gameplay to its narrative. It just is what it is with this mission. 
This is one of those jobs that's more about setting up plot points than it is actual gameplay, so I think it's fine for what it is. As we prove our ability to her, she rewards us with a key to Dimitri's nightclub that we are free to use however we want. A gesture that Sly appreciates greatly. With Neela being new, it's good to have some scenes where we get to know her a little bit. After all, our interaction with her in the tutorial was over very quickly, and so it's just good to establish her more early on. It's time for another first. The next job is Disco Demolitions, and it's our first time controlling Bentley ever in the series. Bentley is essentially the exact opposite of Murray. You don't want to engage in close quarters combat with him. It takes him a ton of hits to dispatch guards, and his melee range is pretty pathetic. You are meant to play him as a range and stealth character. He gets access to sleep darts that will pump your enemies full of that sweet melatonin, knocking them out with ease. He also has access to bombs that can be used to one-shot sleeping enemies. And you know, I'm sitting here after writing that last sentence, and I can't help but think, Bentley is a bit of a serial killer, isn't he? I mean, Sly and Murray are content with just knocking guards out, but Bentley? He's blowing baddies away to smithereens. Wow, that's awesome. Reaching the nightclub, Bentley gives Sly the breakdown of exactly what he plans to do. The incredible part about this is not what Bentley is saying, but how he says it. He is terrified and nervous and wants to keep moving to stay safe. This is his first time out on a mission alone, and it shows. He's not comfortable spending too long on FaceTime with Sly because he's afraid of being discovered by Dimitri's henchmen. It would have been really easy to overlook this detail and write Bentley like Sly and Murray, but that wouldn't be accurate to his character, and it's nice to see they fully considered that. The job itself acts as a good introduction to Bentley's functionality, as you get to practice mostly shooting sleep darts and using bombs. It's a fine mission and ends with the most calm earthquake you'll ever see, as Bentley drops the giant disco ball to shake the entire nightclub in an effort to free the peacock sign. That brings us to our next slideshow, and it's finally heist time. All the jobs we've completed up to this point have been in service to this grand operation. This is where shit hits the fan. This is the do or die moment. This is where we accomplish what we set out to do. Okay, fellas, the dominoes are all in place. Time to pull off the big heist. First, Murray will help me break into the old water tower. From there, I should be able to shut down the plaza fountain. Dimitri's sure to send someone out to get the repair truck. Sly, you'll pickpocket the truck keys off this guy once he shows up. Then hand them off to me and Murray in the plaza. We'll go steal the truck while you climb to the top of the nightclub's peacock sign. When you're in position, Murray will fire the truck's winch line up to you and will use it to pull down the sign. If my calculations are correct, the impact should create an entrance to the printing press room. Then, Sly, you jump in, grab the clockwork tail feathers, and we all get the heck out of here! These full-scale operations are where this game really shines the most. Both the niche gameplay mechanics and the core gameplay mechanics are thrown at you again with more demands as the story's twist and turns unfold. The jobs are fun on their own for the most part, but it's rewarding to see them all lead up to something big, which is exactly what these operations are. Our plan is simple. Send the nightclub sign crashing down, expose an entrance to Dimitri's counterfeit operation, grab the tail feathers, and get out. Again, this is the opening chapter, so most of it is to introduce you to the structure of the game, and so this one is fairly basic. The first few parts of the job go off without a hitch, as we re-encounter some of the mechanics we've experienced so far by pickpocketing guards and dealing with some guards in combat. There's also this weird puzzle with Bentley. I, I mean, it might not actually be a puzzle. I can't remember. I just turned all five cranks and it was solved. I have truly ascended, I guess, in puzzle solving. I don't know, but there it is. We did it. And with the peacock sign down, Sly jumps in to grab the clockwork tail feathers, 
but since this is a video game, there's gotta be a boss fight. I love this dialogue between Sly and Dimitri, and you know what? I'm just gonna let it play out. It's that good. So raccoonas do this. Right, totally bumming my house up and bringing me down. So very uncool. Why can't you let birds and bees be free, bro? Listen, Dimitri. You have no idea what you're playing with. It'll bring more than your house down. Look, bro. I see you are a tough cowboy. A man with taste, style, vision, a connoisseur of finer things. Like me. Look, I'm sure that two cats in a bag like us can work something out. Yeah? We smooth. Yeah? Look. See the money. You like the money. You can take all you want. I can. No deal. You and the rest of the Claw Gang have to be stopped. Clockwork will never again see the light of day. Just hand over the tail feathers and we can... What is this with clocks, bro? Have you no vision? Are you hearing what I mean to you? Do you think you have juice? Don't show me a little mind when talking about such big things. Do you think you can swing the bat? Show your bling and let me shine you. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. No! Let's dance! You can really tell how much Sly has grown both through his words and Kevin Miller's far superior take on the character this time around. He can still be playful, but his serious voice is so much more impactful in the sequel. This juxtaposes so well with Dimitri's 80s vocabulary as the lounge lizard can barely make out what Sly is saying and vice versa. Dimitri isn't as much of an intimidating presence as Claw Gang members to come, but there's a reason he's the most beloved from the game. From his lingo, to his design, to his catch song Let's Dance, he just oozes a lovable charm. His boss fight, like others in this game, are fairly rudimentary. Avoid his attacks and dish out your own damage. He has two melee attacks and can also shoot purple lightning at you, I guess. I have no clue what the explanation for the purple lightning is, he just kind of does it. And that's strange. See? I knew I could be critical of this game. Hard hitting criticism too. Dimitri's ranged attack isn't explained. Take that, Sly 2! Anyway, after beating him, the gang escapes as Carmelita bursts in to ship the bad guy to jail, a la tradition. The gang celebrates by taking some time off before preparing for their next heist. In terms of some overall thoughts, The Black Chateau, the first chapter here, accomplishes what it sets out to do. It introduces the player to the mechanics and the idea of navigating hub worlds. The world is designed to be easy to navigate, with very little verticality and lots of huge open rooftops that provide safety. We also get our first taste of controlling Bentley and Murray in a pretty safe context, while also exploring a new mechanic with Sly's pickpocketing. It's a serviceable chapter, but by no means the best. Our second chapter is A Starry-Eyed Encounter, and introduces us to a new villain, Rajan, an illegal spice distributor who went from rags to riches through his business. It's suggested that he's an egomaniac and is obsessed with making sure others view him as being supremely wealthy. And it just so happens he's throwing a ball to display his newest purchase, the Clockwork Wings. Sly gives a harrowing recap of how, for the Cooper line, seeing the wings in the night sky meant certain death. Before we jump into our reconnaissance work, I wanted to take a moment to talk more about the hub world design in Sly 2. The team had a little bit of practice creating hub worlds in Sly 1, but they were much less important in that game as they were essentially just a locale to house the different stages. Everything we do in Sly 2 takes place in these hub worlds or the buildings that they contain, and so it was important to get this aspect right. Since this game introduced other elements alongside of the platforming challenges, it was important to make sure that the level design shouldered some of the responsibility for maintaining the platformer label, and it does so successfully. After the first hub world kept it pretty simple, all the rest of the hub worlds, outside of maybe the sixth, are full of traversal options that remind you of a jungle gym. 
One of the best gameplay feelings the player gets from these games is having Sly so effortlessly jump from point to point, rooftop to rooftop, and cable to cable without ever getting winded. It was important to design worlds that maintain that feeling that the first game created, and they accomplished that goal. The hub worlds are big enough to get lost in your first time through, but small enough that you can familiarize yourself with them pretty quickly. It's like you're mastering the terrain, kinda like Sly. That's a nice connection between player and player character. They're also designed in a way that traversing with Bentley and Murray feels alright as well, although they are a lot more limited, which is to be understood. With the other two characters having to utilize footpaths more, Sly's abilities stand out for the better. Besides, it's not like Murray and Bentley can't reach rooftops, there are plenty of bounce pads to accomplish that. The world design achieved a good balance that allows Sly's traversal to feel superior without making the other two unbearable. It's time to gather intel, and to do so, we'll have to infiltrate Rajan's ballroom. Gracefully working his way through the tree branches, Sly reaches a balcony to access the luxurious party. Out of all the recon jobs in the game, this one is probably the best. With bright lights and tons of people, it's easy to feel exposed, but hiding out in the dark room lends a feeling of comfort, and Sly is in his element. We grab some pictures here of the clockwork wings, which Rajan has bolted onto a giant statue in middle of a massive party. It's clear to the gang that getting them out won't be easy. In fact, it's going to take a Herculean effort. To make matters worse, Rajan's party guests house a lot of dangerous people for the Cooper clan. We see Carmelita and Neela here, probably working undercover to try to take down the Claw Gang. We also meet a spider woman named Contessa, who is a cop working for Interpol. Law enforcement is everywhere, and that's going to throw a huge wrench into the gang's operation. On top of that, two other Claw Gang members are here, Jean Besson and Arpeggio. There's so much more to digest here than in our first recon job, where we just saw Dimitri and the Tail Feathers, and that's it. It painted a simple picture. Get in, grab the goods, get out. The same can't be said anymore though. We've got to get these humongous wings off the statue and out of the building while not tipping off any of the cops or claw gang members. The odds are stacked against us. Pulling off a job of this scale will speak to the legacy of the Cooper clan and the player really feels that. It's great. To get anything done though, we're going to have to first lower the drawbridge so that Bentley and Murray can also access the castle grounds. This is a fairly standard pickpocket challenge similar to the one in Dimitri's world. It's taken up a beat by having guards out in the open world, meaning you have to worry about navigation, positioning, and also the threat of additional guards. I mean, it's not that hard, nothing in this game really is but it does elevate the challenge with this mission. While it plays out, I wanted to discuss the quality of the animation in this game. And discussing the presentation elements of a game from 15 years ago is always tricky, so bear that in mind. For the most part, I think many of the animations still hold up pretty well. Sly is nimble with a controlled twitchiness that makes it clear he's always on his toes. Murray is more hawking and blubbery as he runs. His raw strength means getting caught isn't the end of the world for him, and his posture conveys this easygoing nature. It's the complete opposite for Bentley, though. He's constantly looking around, anxious all the time for what might be around every corner. The animations, including walking, running, crouching, jumping, climbing, and sneaking, have all held up relatively well since 2004. And the same goes for the villains. Dimitri walks with a smugness that oozes out of men who are full of themselves. Rajan is often spotted posing when he stops walking, keying in on how desperate he is to be seen. And Jean Besson kind of just hikes along with his walking stick, undeterred by anything around him. 
For the most part, the animations of characters do give a brief glimpse into their personality if you take the time to notice it. In the in-game cutscenes though, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes characters look like animatronics with their heads swiveling back and forth and their jaws just kind of flapping as their bodies hardly move. Sometimes it's passable, but other times it just looks rough. Real rough. This mediocrity extends to the Binocicom discussions as well. Sometimes Sly's hat will just bug out for no reason. And another negative with the animations has to do with the guards, because all their movements are just nothing more than alright. Guards have a simple path that they follow and stop every few seconds to scratch themselves or look around. They do a decent enough job of queuing the player in on their route, but not much more than that, and I can't help but feel a little more life could have been pumped into these worlds if guards behave uniquely or differently across the stages. Animations in combat are also serviceable. Our characters actually have a combat stance where they hop up and down a bit as they wait to strike. It subtly conveys a sense of urgency to the player that goes well with the more in-your-face threat of having a rhino throwing knives at you. Our strikes are also pretty good too. I love how Murray's fists kind of seem to get a little bit bigger as he swings, emphasizing his strength. And Sly and Bentley use their cane and bowcaster to thwack guards, and that's fine too. All in all, the animations of this game were good for the time, but are starting to show their age, although that's kind of to be expected. Sly 3 would clean up a lot of these issues, and since this game design is such a departure from the first, I'm willing to give them a break, especially since it was a two-year development cycle. Still, like I said, the imperfections get more and more noticeable, every time I play this game. The next two missions end up feeling kind of convoluted if you spend too long thinking about them, which is of course exactly what I'm doing in this video. For some reason, it's important for Sly to get into Rajan's party, although we're not really given a reason why up front. He pretty stupidly walks right up to the front door and bangs on it trying to get in. Sly, um, dude, I understand you're a master of your craft and all, but in what world would walking through the front door into a party full of guards, villains, and cops without a disguise be in your best interest? What's that? None. That's right. Luckily, the guards turn us away since we don't have a tuxedo on. A formal party calls for formal attire, and Bentley suggests we may be able to find a spare in the guest house, so that's where we head next. This part of the job is about getting the player to distinguish when stealth or combat is the better option and then executing appropriately. There are five rooms, each with a piece of tuxedo that will of course fit Sly perfectly. Each room, as well as the hallways, has guards on duty, some smaller and some bigger. We've been taught so far that Sly is capable of dealing with small guards relatively easily, but we'll struggle against bigger guards. Using this logic, the player can deduce it's best to avoid or stealth kill any big guards before going head on with the smaller guards who become alerted by killing the big one. Once the guards are dealt with, the player is free to ransack the whole room unbothered searching for the tuxedo piece. From a gameplay perspective, it's a good mission because the player has been given the knowledge to tackle it in the most efficient way possible and it's up to them to execute on it. Getting caught in such a small area also raises the tension and threat level so it keeps people on their toes. I remember playing this as a kid amazed by how atmospheric it was. This is Rajad's room. Stay sharp. He's probably got extra security. I can't tell if part of that has gone away as I've grown into an adult, 
or if repetition of playing this game so many times made it vanish. Anyway, with the tuxedo in hand, we can head back to the ballroom. We start the mission without our tuxedo on, and that's just weird, right? The guard asks us if we have our tuxedo, who shows up to a party and says, oh, let me change once I'm already inside the party. It, it's so strange. Not to mention, Rajan has a guest list. We overheard this in the guest house, so why are we even allowed in? Attention guards, this is Lord Rajan. The party here is in full swing and all visitors are now in the ballroom. The game basically says, uh, don't think about it, and we move inward. Sly puts on his tuxedo, and, uh, well, it's hardly much of a disguise, Sly. You look exactly the same except with a tuxedo on instead of your normal attire. It's so bizarre seeing intelligent characters like Neela and Carmelita being completely bamboozled by this rudimentary outfit. I mean, come on, you're telling me Carmelita, who has spent her whole career trying to capture Sly, cannot recognize him here? I'm calling bullshit on this one, but, you know, whatever. I forgot how poor the background characters in this area look. They're literally just semi-3D models of darkened out shades all looking exactly the same, like a pig in a top hat. It's easy to nitpick now, of course, but even for 2004, I think they could have done a little better than this. What follows is an introduction to a new mechanic that will only be used in this chapter, dancing to a minigame. Bentley tells us that we need to dance with Carmelita during the heist, and since she's picky about dance partners, she will need evidence of your skill. Super contrived, I know. Anyway, Sly approaches Neela, and the two dance the night away while the player completes a memorization minigame that's very easy and hardly punishes the player for messing up. It gets the job done though, Carmelita agrees to dance with us later in the evening, and with that, this strange pair of jobs is complete. It's back to Murray for our next job, and Bentley tasks us with destroying Rajan's security helicopter to stop it from throwing a wrench into our operation. In order to do that, we'll have to use an old defense turret to take it out, and I'm glad they say old too, because it controls like it's ancient. We're told to shoot down the chopper, which wouldn't be so bad if the controls weren't so stiff. Even at the time, this thing couldn't have felt good to control. It lacks enough precision that it feels noticeable. It seems though that the design team realized this and made things a bit easier on the player to compensate. They did this by having the helicopter's missiles fly very close together, sometimes in overlapping positions so that they could be shot down with less maneuvering from the player. Big flex coming here, but for me, I complete the mission without a job failed screen, but I could see this being a pain for a first time player, especially when games have become so much more pronounced when it comes to precision aiming. It at least gives Murray a job of his own in this chapter, you know, at the very least. After getting another briefing, our next job is to hack into Rajan's security system to gain access to the electronic winch hanging above the clockwork wings. We'll need access to it for the heist, and all three of our heroes are needed to get this job done. I'll talk about this more later, but the game does just alright at divvying up jobs between Sly, Bentley, and Murray, but it does contain a decent number of missions where two members or all three members have to work together to complete a task. The best jobs are ones like Boardroom Brawl, where all three members are working in unison out in the field at once. It feels like a coming together party of sorts. We start by infiltrating Rajan's palace and finding a way to let Bentley and Murray in. Sly has to sneak around and discover a password that allows him to unlock a laser security system in order to get a switch. It all feels very sneaky and thiefy. While I'm here, I also grab the Clue Bottle Vault power-up for Sly, which is an added bonus. The second half of the job is about protecting Bentley as he hacks into the computer mainframe. We play as Murray as he and Sly fend off wave after wave of guards in order to keep Bentley safe. You get a real sense of the trust that exists between the group members, 
Bentley feels completely comfortable working knowing that his back is covered. The job is also a huge boost to Bentley's confidence as we can see it when he lets out a cheer of success upon completing the job. I'm unstoppable! I've got control of the winch! Thanks for the backup, guys! He's still new to being out in the field, but being with his friends puts him at ease. And don't forget, with this job done, the gang now has access to that winch for the heist. Speaking of Bentley, it's time to get back out there as the Geeky Turtle. We're introduced to a new mechanic that we'll see a lot more throughout the game, controlling an RC vehicle. Sly explains how to control it, and, and I just love how they just said, you know what, screw it, we have to break the fourth wall, as Sly tells the player exactly what to do. It's not the only instance of this, but I just love it. You Use the left analog stick to steer the chopper, and hit the X button to drop bombs. If you lose track of the Jeep, I'll project a holographic targeting arrow. Follow it back into the action. You could argue that the remote Bentley has contains a left stick and an X button, but you know what? I'm gonna stop right there. We don't need to get that deep into it. It's fourth wall breaking, and I'm all good with it. We have to chase down and blow up a security vehicle so that both the skyways and ground pass will be clear for the heist. It's fairly simple so long as you remember to do hard turns to avoid missiles. I like how the bombs are just green balls because PS2, and that's it. Really, there isn't too much more to say about this mission. It's fine for what it is. It's an introduction to controlling the RC chopper, which will be built on further and further as the game goes on. The next mission is somewhat of a platforming task for Sly. In order to cut the wings off of Rajan's statue, the Cooper gang will need an incredibly durable saw. To make a blade strong enough, Bentley commissions Sly to retrieve gems from Rajan's prized elephants that are made of super strong diamond. In order to get a crack at them, Sly has to get on top of the elephant's backs and whack at each diamond till it pops off. Every time you get a diamond, the elephant knocks you off its back, requiring you to find a way back on. It tests the player on their ability to track the creature, get high ground on it, and then time their leap down. Eventually, the elephants also start swinging at you with their trunks, and so you'll have to leap over each attack or take damage as a consequence. It's one of the more unique platforming challenges of the game, and it stands out because of it. It's a solid effort in maintaining the platformer label that this series' roots are so close to. With everything set to go, our group makes their move for the clockwork wings. Bentley eliminates the presence of guards by blowing up the bridge to the guest hall, and Sly captivates the crowd with a beautiful dance with Carmelita. All the while, Murray uses these distractions to saw off the clockwork wings using the saw fashion from the elephant diamonds. One of the best moments in the entire game happens here when the dance ends and Rajan and Carmelita realize exactly what has happened. Tell me, stranger. What's your name? Why ruin the moment? Huh? I, I don't understand. The wings! What happened to the clockwork wings? What? How? Who could have... What? Cooper! It really shows how in their element the Cooper gang is. But if you think about it too hard, it's clear the group got super lucky that not one guest member noticed what was going on and that Sly's dance moves were just that graceful. But you know what, whatever. I forgot to mention also, there's some weird graphical and audio hiccups in these first two parts of the missions. For example, Bentley takes just enough time between saying his lines for it to feel like something off the blooper reel. Okay, Bentley, Murray and I are moving into position. You still think you can demolish something that large? It doesn't take an engineer to figure out how to blow up a bridge. I'll start by placing charges on all of the lower cleats. Once the structure destabilizes, those retainer rings on the upper cleats should pop right off. That should enable me to bomb all of the upper cleats. While you can basically also see the character models being teleported in right before their dialogue lines in the dance sequence.
I also don't like how they put the party goer silhouettes on this upper balcony. Clearly, these cardboard cutouts would see Murray and say something. All of these are super nitpicky things, though, and don't detract too much from the moment. From there, Bentley must protect Murray as he makes his way back to the van with the wings for the getaway. Murray must have taken route planning lessons from the alchemist in Fractured Hills from Spyro 2 because he goes the least efficient way as possible. This is of course done so that the player has to defend Murray for a prolonged period of time, but it does come off as quite idiotic for a group of well-known and unstoppable thieves who are ultra-coordinated. As the challenges continue onward, guard locations become less predictable and telegraphed, which you'd expect. It's still nothing too difficult, and with that, Sly and the gang have made off with their second clockwork part. In the cutscene wrapping up this chapter, we learn that Rajan escaped and that Carmelita arrested a bunch of lawbreakers at the party. Sly has some anxiety about Rajan still being out there and knows their business isn't over yet. This foreshadows the leap forward the story is about to take over the next few chapters as the Cooper gang gets more involved and recognized by the Claw gang and law enforcement for what they're attempting to do. Really, these first two chapters show the Cooper gang at their best when things go right, but their luck is starting to run out. With that, it's time to start chapter three, The Predator Awakes a title that of course refers to Rajan. He's in isolation now, away from the eyes of his peers, and with his ego tarnished, he's more dangerous than ever. We also learn that he's transformed an isolated ruin into his headquarters for producing illegal spices. The game has done a good job hinting at the larger role Spice will play in the narrative, but now we're coming face to face with it. The overarching narrative is starting to take place and shit will really hit the fan in episode 3. To make matters worse, Rajan is in possession of the clockwork heart and it's allowing him to increase spice production by tenfold, which is terrible, so you know, we gotta go get it back. Before starting that endeavor though, I wanted to talk about the optional task of stealing art pieces. Throughout each map are a collection of three art pieces that Sly can steal and return to the safe house for a number of coins. This was first introduced in the Bugging Dimitri's office job in Chapter 1, but it's available to do throughout the game. You can find these art pieces scattered throughout the map, and getting them back to the safe house without taking damage gives you a chance to get more coins to use for power-ups. It encourages stealth since taking damage means the art pieces break. This challenge is further enhanced by some art pieces that contain self-destruct timers that will make the art piece explode unless you get it back to the safe house in time. For the most part, these times are pretty generous though, which kind of defeats the purpose of them in the first place. Overall though, I'm glad they included this, even if it's not a super robust system. And we'll talk about power-ups later, but for now, suffice it to say, I don't really think they're that worth it. However, by going after these art pieces before starting any missions, just like the clue bottles, the player gets a better understanding of the map layout, which comes in handy. This is especially the case for this chapter, in which the verticality range of the map has been dramatically increased. Also, since we're here, let me just say it, I like the implementation of safe houses, you get to see some prominent parts of the map in the background, and it gives you a location to unwind in between missions. If it's the start of a new chapter, it's recon time. Sly sneaks into Rajan's spice treatment facility to grab some photographs. Every chapter also introduces a new quote-unquote mechanic for Sly, just like in the first game. However, all of these mechanics are just the same button inputs we've been doing for the whole series now. Press X, and then press circle. The second chapter introduced the ninja spire jump, while this one gives us the rail slide. These new environmental movement strategies are used alongside of others to build up platforming challenges, and that's a really good idea. We can see that Rajan is very paranoid now. He's split the heart in half, with one part of it being used to super irrigate his spice crops, 
while keeping the other half on him most of the time for protection. After losing the wings by being distracted, it's clear Rajan won't let that happen again. Besides that, Sly uncovers a hidden entrance to this level, but Bentley can't find it on the map. It's clear the Cooper gang has another tough assignment ahead of them, and for now, the planning can begin. One thing I really appreciate about this game and its sequel is that players are given the chance to select which job they want to do next. If you want to switch things up and play as another character, you can do that if there's more missions available. It sounds super small, but when that went away in Thieves in Time, I hated it. Anyway, I decided to do Water Bug Run next, a job where we bug Rajan's office with a literal bug. Yep, this bug is apparently able to transmit sound waves in frequencies that Bentley can pick up on at the safe house. If you know anything about bugs or how sound works, you know this is stupid, but whatever, it's a game with talking animals. The water bug becomes unhappy without water, and so the player is encouraged to stop by pools of water to soothe the bug so that it doesn't attract attention from guards. I did take this approach on this playthrough, but usually I just run full speed right to Rajan's office. The guards can never keep up with the mobility of Sly, so it's really just the fastest method. It may just be an oversight that renders this job much faster than originally intended. Freeing the elephant is another job for Sly, and it's centered on platforming. This mission really tests the player's understanding of the map layout, as you'll have to reach points way up in the trees in order to get at the required spice plants. The goal is to use the craziness-inducing effect of the spice to add a little chaos to this elephant's life. The hope is that provoking it into a fit of rage will send it tearing off, leaving Rajan without his communication satellite. After a foreshadowing comment from Sly, we're off to retrieve the high up spice plants. Now the local spice plants are illegal for good reason. Eat too many and you'll go into a fit of uncontrolled rage. Keep that stuff away from Murray. Oh wait, wait, I get it. I put some spice plants in the elephant's feed bag. He chows down, gets all crazy, and then presto, the satellite's in pieces. This job requires timing and route planning to pull off, and again, illustrates Sly's incredible athleticism. It's a good challenge, and it's a smart way to show us as players the effect that Spice has on living creatures, given how important a role it will play on the overall story. I always did find it weird, though, that Rajan's prized elephants, and this one here, aren't humans. I mentioned this in the Sly 1 video, but what factor dictates if an animal in the Sly world will behave like an animal or a human? Very strange. Yet, let me be clear, I'm glad there's no humans in this world, don't get me wrong. Leading Rajan is one of the most exhilarating and tense missions in the whole game, but it has some really good elements, as well as some pretty bad elements. So let's start with a breakdown of what we have to do. We play as Bentley, and our goal is to lift the blueprints to Rajan's spice operation right off of his torso. To do this, we'll have to put him to sleep using Bentley's darts, although not in the traditional way. Bentley has equipped his darts with a noisemaker that will attract Rajan to some watermelons that must be full of some melatonin or some shit. Maybe this is the juice they use to make NyQuil, it seems like it anyway. From there, we lift the blueprint off of Rajan, rinse and repeat until the mission's over. We'll start with the bad things by keeping it right there. The whole mission is just so contrived, and it feels like it's part of a video game. Granted, this mission is contextualized about as well as most other games of 2004, but you can't shake that feeling in 2020. I mean, of course Rajan doesn't have the clockwork hard on his stick like we saw in Recon, so we can't just nab it, a point that Sly calls attention to. He doesn't have that section of the clockwork heart we saw during the Recon. You could just pump him full of sleep darts and we could all go home. Super convenient, huh? Second, we have to lure him on three separate occasions instead of just grabbing all three parts of the blueprint in one go, which again doesn't make a lot of sense. 
So that's a bit of the narrative issues, but from a gameplay perspective, the limited range of the Banakikam shooting system makes things annoying sometimes. The first two challenges are, you know, pretty easy. However, the last one is difficult because there will be times when you try to aim for the ground and end up hitting the tree or something else in the field of vision, which sets you back. And the worst case scenario is you shoot right where you're standing by accident, where Jean runs over and you fail the mission while hearing these infamous words. A viper in the grass! Your best bet is to get a vantage point that Rajan can't reach and lure him from there, powering through sometimes crappy sleep dart hit detection along the way. I think this mission is a case of the good outweighing the bad though. First of all, like I said, it's a super tense mission that can see you on the edge of your seat, as a lot of the time you'll have to lure Rajan very close to Bentley's location. It can be heart pounding having to lure this feral beast around with the ever present anxiety of getting caught. It's atmospheric in the best way. Not to mention guards still roam the map which adds a nice level of challenge as you have to consider them while planning on how to lead Rajan. And from a narrative perspective it also feels like a massive step forward for Bentley. At the beginning of the game he was terrified to be in the field fumbling through his words in the tutorial, and having the jitters in Dimitri's nightclub. Here though, he is ultra confident in his plan and ability to execute on it, so much so that he has no problem getting up close and personal with a very dangerous guy. We're starting to see his arc take fold, and that's excellent. Oh boy, it's time to chase after Constable Neela again in this next mission, but not before getting a hint of flirtiness from Sly towards the Pink Panther. The last game emphasized a romantic dynamic between Sly and Carmelita, but those two haven't gotten much time together this time around. Instead, between helping them out and her, uh, striking features, I guess? It seems that Sly is kind of falling for Neela. He even asks her out on a date, and by the mission's end, she accepts that date. Look, Neela, as soon as this India job is over, why don't you and I go out on the town? We'll dance through Bollywood and eat curry all night long. And? And? And we're on for that date in Bollywood. It's showing us as a player that Sly is becoming more and more comfortable around Neela and building up a dynamic between them. Gameplay-wise, it's just another mission where we have to follow behind her, and it's more egregious than the rest, considering where she's leading us to is literally right above us at the start of the mission. She once again takes the longest way possible, and I'm not really sure why the developers didn't start this mission on the other side of the temple's entrance. It would have made a lot more sense over there. As it is now, it's kind of uninspired and a bit lazy. The real reward is waiting for us in the Spice Temple, half of the Clockwork Heart. We have to pickpocket a few guards and use the environment to our advantage, which is great. I also encounter one of these weird pin pads that are scattered only throughout this chapter. I have no clue where Sly gets the password from or what the purpose of these are, but hey, I guess taking down a security system does lend credence to being a thief. Anyway, we lead this mission with the first half of the Clockwork Heart, and our faith in Neela has never been higher. It's time to target Rajan's spice operation at its core. We'll have to blow the spice grinder to smithereens, and in order to do that, we're going to have to learn how to handle TNT. This game took the barrel disguise from Sly 1 and retooled it to act as a portable bomb. It's strange this mission isn't for Bentley though, given he is the demolitions expert and nothing in this mission specifically requires Sly's skill set. The gimmick is basically platforming and stealthing around with a reduced amount of movement. It functions well as a gimmick, a quick thing to change up the pace and offer a variance on the traditional playstyle, but I'm glad it's not a mainstay across the game. Whenever games restrict a player's mobility for too long, it can end up feeling very tedious and monotonous very quickly. Luckily, Sly 2 avoids this issue with its barrel missions by only having a handful in the game. 
Because of its low quantity, the missions don't feel intrusive, but instead feel like a new way of challenging your understanding of how guards and security systems function. All in all, it's a good mission, maybe not the most memorable, but solid in offering up some variety. It's back to Bentley for another foray into the world. We're tasked with destroying the dam above the temple in order to flood Rajan out. This mission plays out as another turret section, and it's just as stiff as the first time we played one as Murray. This time, our target is stationary, but there's a lot of attack helicopters coming after us. The key is to spend most of your time hammering away at the dam, but keeping an eye on choppers as they get closer. Once they get too close, their missiles aren't going to miss you, so it's best to take them out without letting them get on top of you. Fighting against the controls is what makes this job difficult, and so it ends up being a bad experience. Whenever a failure stems from the game design and not you as a player, it feels unfair and undeserved, and these turret sections suffer from this. Also, at the end of the job, we have the most uneventful plane crash ever, as the helicopter lands perfectly on top of this tower, and Bentley forcefully falls to the bottom while avoiding major injury. Good thing he's a turtle, I guess. It probably saved him in this one. Before our next mission, I wanted to talk about how Sly 2 changed up the health system. Sly 1 was all about platforming, and so it made sense that one screw-up should cost a player one life. To help out struggling players, Lucky Charms were included that would absorb a hit of damage, a la the Mushroom in Mario. It was a perfect fit for that game, but it wouldn't have worked in Sly 2. Enemies surround Sly and the gang on all sides, and having multiple guards attack you at once means that the player is likely to take at least one shot of damage at times. And having to lose progress in a mission because of that would have destroyed the pace of the game, and so something new was needed. And something new is exactly what we got. Sly 2 includes a health bar that doubles as a danger warning for each character, meaning that taking a hit isn't the be-all end-all like before. It's much better suited for this game considering how the player is moving about in large open 3D spaces with full control of the camera instead of just narrow hallways like in the first game. And in fact, running low on health is rarely a concern in Sly 2, as health pickups are always nearby in breakable objects or by killing guards. It does make it seem like the health system rarely plays a factor though, but maybe I just have too much experience with this game to tell for sure. Rip Off the Ruby is our next objective, and it's the mission and this world that requires the skills of all three characters. First, just reaching the mission marker as Sly can be a challenge, as you'll have to do some thinking to reach it on your first try. I like that. After Sly knocks it loose, Bentley and Murray must work together to transfer the ruby to its buyer in exchange for some explosives. Murray really doesn't get much to do in the main missions of this chapter, but he will get a moment to shine in his finale. This mission is fine for what it is. You get a combat section to pulverize some guards as Murray, but besides that, it's just carrying the ruby and throwing it when you need to jump. As far as the missions where all three team members work together, this one is one of the weaker ones. The mediocrity gives way, though, to probably the best heist in the game, Operation Wet Tiger. It starts off as any other, with an ironclad plan to get the other piece of the clockwork heart. Murray aims to pry open the mouth of the elephant statue, while Bentley provides cover in the chopper. The stiff turret controls are once again a slog to get through, but at least they're reusing a mechanic that we've experienced before in this chapter. They repeat this with Sly having to move the Cherry Bomb 500 over by sneaking past guards in it. From a gameplay perspective, it's always good to see the mechanics you spent time practicing in the missions get tested in the final heist. It's, it's just good game design. This challenge with the barrel is fun too, because the game makes sure to spawn guards that can stomp you out quickly if you're not careful. It challenges you as a player to get it right by understanding the enemy pathing. It's all good. Blowing the damn sky high works as intended as soon as an infumed Rajan emerges from his temple. 
He gives an epic bad guy monologue, and I gotta say, I like Rajan. He's easily the most intimidating member of the Claw Gang with his snarl and narcissistic outlook. Clouds and thunderbolts, my spice temple, ruined! I will no longer hide while you villains destroy my hard-won empire! This place is mine! Here I am king! Come, face me, Cooper! With Clockwork's black heart, I will show you true power! You are nothing! Come face the might of Rajan, Lord of these hills! He wants to crush anyone that opposes him, and we've just ticked him off. Neela shows up and wants first crack at arresting Rajan after Sly and the gang get the heart. After an odd platforming section from these newly formed wooden spikes, things start to go wrong. Both operations we've done so far in the game have gone off without a hitch, but the Cooper gang's luck has run out. Sly gets blasted by a bolt of lightning, and Murray jumps into the shallow pool of water to check in on his friend. Rajan leaps in, intending to finish the gang off once and for all. I love this exchange between Murray and Rajan. I could quote it all, but I'm just going to let it play out. This is it? This is the Cooper gang I've heard so much about and feared these long hours? The Murray will renew your fear! Who's the Murray? All I see is a fat, pathetic weakling. I might be big and not as smart as the other guys, but one thing I'm not is weak. It's nice to see Murray with such confidence after the last game. It's here where we get our sole Murray boss fight of the game, and to be quite honest, it's lacking in content. I understand that combat takes a backseat behind platforming and stealth in this game, but this was a true chance to have Murray's skill set shine, but instead the player isn't challenged in any new or interesting ways. Rajan has a pretty sizable health bar, but he only spams the same attack over and over again, a leg sweep followed by an overhead strike. The fight is supposed to be made more challenging when he brings in guards, but half the time he just ends up killing them himself. Rajan really needed to have some more moves as the fight went on to really make this an engaging bout between two relatively strong guys. Instead, it's just five minutes of dodging the same attack and following it up with two punches over and over again until eventually the tiger is defeated. Look, all I'm saying is that Murray was built for combat, so give us a good combat challenge. Rajan, while I love his character, is sadly not a good boss fight. And to be quite honest, when considering spectacle and mechanics, I'd probably say he's the worst of the game. After the brawl, shit really hits the fan as Neela reveals she's been a double agent the entire time, playing the Cooper gang like a fiddle in order to reach this point where Rajan and most of the gang is incapacitated. She even wraps Carmelita into the whole thing after revealing she has photo evidence of the esteemed policewoman cooperating with Sly on the night the wings were stolen. She holds up a picture of her and Sly dancing, and it's the nail in the coffin. Sly stands, love Carmelita, and it makes sense for Neela to go after criminals, but one of her own? Despicable. Unfortunately, there's an annoying sound glitch that plays throughout the scene in the remake, and it does detract from the experience a little bit, but anyway, it's still gold. I'll get you, Neela. Don't think I won't. Such a pity when an officer falls from the light. I admit this is a nostalgic indulgence, but this moment blew my mind as a child. I felt betrayed and played like a big sucker, and I hated Neela for screwing over the characters that I loved. But it does make her a more worthwhile character. She goes from being not much more than a boring gameplay mechanic to a character who gets emotion out of us, which is what every good character should do. This emotional high point for her is sadly her tipping point though, as the rest of her involvement in the story can feel nonsensical and pretty plot contrived. For now though, Bentley is left on his own for the first time. The only life he has ever known is alongside of Sly and Murray, and now they're gone. 
His analytical mind gives way to his primal brain as fear and anxiety start to grip him as he makes his way back to the team van. He's stunned at the events that have transpired and has found a new resolve to save his friends. And my god, what a huge challenge that will be for his character. But luckily, he's been able to build up some confidence in himself from the events that have transpired thus far throughout the game. After riding through most of the first act, the Cooper gang is all but toast, and only a small sliver of hope remains, and it takes the form of a small genius turtle. My resolve was hardened. I had to save my friends. But first things first, I had to learn how to drive a stick shift. It's time for action. Bentley narrates the introduction to the next chapter, Jailbreak. I love that these sections are told from Bentley's perspective. It really gives us some more insight into his character. He spent a week just data crunching to find Sly, he's gotten the van from India to Prague, and he's set up a new safe house, all in service of saving Sly and Murray. We get some backstory on the Contessa here too, a member of Interpol who rose quickly through the ranks due to her abilities with hypnosis. She now runs a prison in Prague and acts as head warden. Somewhere in this massive estate, Sly and Murray are under wraps. The idea of a jailbreak just fits perfectly into a game about a band of thieves, and it really packs a huge narrative punch for this title. Sitting in the safe house is haunting. A dark, unforgiving world looms behind Bentley, and within this structure sits two empty chairs. Why set the chairs up unless you're convinced they will be filled shortly? Stepping outside unveils an atmosphere we've yet to experience. An uncaring and unflinching world where everything is monitored and kept on lockdown. It's the best location in the game, and that's saying something. Bentley gets to work by eavesdropping on the Contessa to get some information. We learn rather anticlimactically that the Contessa is a member of both Interpol and the Claw Gang, meaning she's a double agent, and I think this information is given to us too quickly. She alludes to using the power of Rajan Spice as an agent to make her prisoners susceptible to hypnosis. Piecing together what we know at this point, it seems like the Claw Gang's main project is using the clockwork parts to create illegal spices to influence people into telling them where they hid their riches. And for now, that's all we know. The Contessa makes it clear that she has a vested interest in seeing to it that Sly and Murray break within the prison so that she can reap the rewards of the massive fortune that they've surely assembled over the years. Bentley is disgusted with the spider lady, deeming her double-dip approach to opposite sides of the law to be a heinous and immoral act. He vows once again to free his friends, and that starts with getting Sly out. Not to end this section on a bad note, but it is strange how contrived this mission is. The Contessa is just talking to herself. I mean, I guess a lot of evil villains in fiction do this, but it's such a huge plot convenience. Also, how does she not notice Bentley's darts hitting her, and why don't they have the sleep effect on her? It's kind of a poor implementation of a game mechanic into the wider narrative. This next mission introduces perhaps the most iconic minigame in all of Sly Cooper history, Hacking Computer Terminals. Technically, this was introduced at the end of Sly 1, but it was a very minimalistic version of what we have here. Play Sly 1 and you'll see how much Sucker Punch loved their twin stick shooter sections, and so it's nice to see them return here in a more refined way. Hacking in Sly 2, from a gameplay perspective, means taking control of a little tank and shooting your way through levels. It's a good way of contextualizing hacking in a child-oriented game. 
The defense tanks that come after you are like anti-hacking software, while the red barricades act as firewalls. And of course, a successful hack means reaching and turning a key point that unlocks your access into the data you're seeking. This system translates coding into a fun experience while not abandoning all the principles that you'd associate with a general understanding of hacking. It starts you off easy with plenty of cover and just a few enemies, but by your fifth and sixth hack, you can run into different enemies as over the span of six challenges, they introduce more open spaces, more enemies, more barricades, and combining those in different ways to give you a challenge. It's not rocket science, and this isn't the greatest game ever simply because it introduces a mechanic and then builds on it. A lot of games do this, but when it's not done well, it sticks out like a sore thumb, and Sly 2 doesn't falter on this very often. If you did watch my Sly 1 video, you know, I couldn't stand most of the mini-games, and I felt like it really dragged down the entire experience. I'll talk about this more when we get to Chapter 7, but for now, suffice it to say that the mini-games are handled a lot better in Sly 2. It's almost time to break Sly out of the big house, but as we do that, I want to spend some time talking about Bentley's strengths and weaknesses from a gameplay design standpoint. Essentially, all three of our characters have two or three central mechanics that the game uses to build jobs around. For Murray, it's combat, picking things up, and a few mini-games. For Sly, it's platforming, pickpocketing, and reconnaissance work. And finally, for Bentley, it's sleep darts, bombing structures, and a lot more mini-games like hacking or controlling the RC vehicles. Bentley is the mastermind and demolitions expert of the gang. He's built a bowcaster that can launch sleeping darts that knock out guards. Given his low damage per hit, it was smart to include an alternative to ensure that playing as Bentley didn't mean having to avoid guards altogether. Getting from point A to point B with Bentley doesn't have to be a nightmare, as he can easily sleep any guards along the way to clear a path. Admittingly, the arrows do sometimes miss, as the hitboxes aren't overly generous and borderline frustrating, which sometimes leads to guards rushing your position if you screw up. It can be pretty easy to get overwhelmed quickly as Bentley, but luckily he can take advantage of the same amount of hiding places as Sly, both under tables and in barrels. The good news is that Bentley's bombs also provide another use besides blowing up structures within certain jobs. Spamming them in combat can be an exhilarating way to knock out guards or even kill them outright. It leads to a certain chaotic element too because you have to try to time the bomb going off with the guard walking into its blast radius all while avoiding being hit by the blast yourself. It can lead to these really frantic moments of leaping and jumping around trying to dodge enemies while giving your bombs time to detonate. It's player created fun and I appreciate that. These two elements allow Bentley to hold up well in the field and also gives him a decent amount of variety within the missions that he's asked to complete. Finally, to round the character's gameplay out, a few set of mini-games are included for Bentley to engage with. We've seen the two big ones already, using the RC Chopper, which we're about to do again next, and hacking computer terminals. Both of these systems are contextualized wonderfully while also giving some much needed diversity to the gameplay while not feeling separate from Bentley's character. They're very well implemented and it's clear they took a lot of time to make sure Bentley's mechanics were rock solid. Anyway, it's finally time to break Sly out of the hole in our next mission, Wall Bombing. We have to take out guards with motion detectors along the prison walls in order to free Sly. This RC Chopper mission is pretty much the hardest in the game, simply because a lot of the enemy counterattacks are very hard to avoid. It's not too bad dodging the big missiles by turning on a dime, but the guard's laser shots almost always hit. Their accuracy is on the levels of Hawkeye. It really becomes a challenge to just defeat all the guards before you take too much damage and lose. I can't imagine how many no-hit runs this mission kills, that is, if Sly 2 no-hit runs are a thing. 
But anyway, once this is done, Sly's cell door just kind of opens for some reason, and he escapes with the cane and Banaki come in hand. This was always a jarring moment to me, at least give us a short mission to get our cane back. That would have been pretty cool, especially since the cane is so iconic to the character, Sly feels naked without it. Bad prison policies aside, we do get this heartwarming moment where Sly refers to Bentley as a wizard, a callback to the tutorial when Sly purposefully kept calling him the wrong name to get him to lighten up. Alpha Foxtrot, this is the wizard. Do you read me, Sitting Duck? This is Peking Duck. I hear you, Blizzard. No, Sly, I'm the wizard, and you're Sitting Duck. I read you loud and clear, Lizard. No, I, I'm... Forget it, you're not taking this seriously. Yeah, I'm not. Look, Bentley, I know this is your first time out in the field, but you've gotta loosen up. If we're gonna get to those clockwork parts, I need you on your toes. Wow, you've really thought of everything. Don't I always? Yeah, you do. Thanks for busting me out. Oh, well, you know the old saying, if you can't count on a friend to bust you out of jail, what kind of a friend are they? Truer words were never said, wizard. Calling him wizard here shows a greater respect for his friend. Getting back to the safe house, Bentley breaks it down on how to get Murray out, and for the only time in the game, we're given five options for what mission to tackle next. The slight increase in available jobs subtly hints to how much work it's going to take in getting Murray out. Our first objective is to get Murray into position by having him fight 50 guards to get thrown into solitary confinement. After sneaking in as Sly, we learn that Murray has been force-fed spice and if that elephant was anything to go off of in the last chapter, that's not good. Since this job is the most combat intensive of any in the game, I figured this would be the best time to talk about the combat of Sly 2. It's very similar to the first outing in the series, with the added addition of health bars. Flashlight guards can take about double damage as regular guards, and so it makes sense to avoid them with more tenacity than you would regular guards. Both you and guards can take more than one hit, which can lead to some pretty frantic moments if your health bar gets too low. Mechanically though, Sly and Murray have two attack commands, while Bentley pretty much has one if you don't include the bombs. Bentley can swat at guards with his bowcaster, while Sly follows suit with his cane. Murray whacks away with his fists, and all of these are done by using the square button. Triangle for Sly and Murray is used to juggle enemies up into the air, but guards can never die to a triangle button hit alone. Sly can use a combo of triangle and square to throw unalerted guards into the air, and then slam them back down to finish them off in one hit. This only works on unsuspecting guards, while the same combo can be used to inflict high damage on guards of any alert status if you're playing as Murray. And as a quick side note, I love that small effect of having words like THWACK fly off of guards who just died, along with the accompanying sound of the horn. It's cartoony, and it fits well. The Murray drops up 20! Anyway, all of this is to say that combat remains generally pretty simple, and I think that makes sense. Combat or running away are the final options if you failed to be stealthy, which is the optimal mode of travel. For what the game is, I think the combat mechanics are fine, and some of the power-ups can make it a little more interesting, but again, more on those later. I think this is also an appropriate place to talk more in-depth about guards and their behavior. In passive mode, the guards simply patrol, looking for one of our three heroes, and they follow the same path over and over again. Once alerted though, they will give chase, but never for very far. In fact, if you're playing as Sly, getting them to unaggro you is pretty easy just by scampering away across two or three rooftops. Getting away sees the guards returning to their post to continue the normal patrol. If you stay close enough though, guards will continue to try to put you down. 
Small guards like the Contessa's foxes or Rajan's monkeys will often attack with melee strikes, whereas flashlight guards like Dimitri's hogs or the Contessa's vultures will shoot at you if you're far away or melee attack you if you get too close. All the guards can be knocked unconscious as well if you get a sneak attack on them, but will punish over aggressive players by kicking back up into the air after getting hit. Some smaller guards also carry loudspeakers with them to call in and alert other guards to attack you, which is a nice touch. The game will never throw more than five or six enemies at you at a time, and so it's best to assess each situation on an individual basis, like what character are you playing as, what's their proficiency in combat like, how many guards are attacking you, are they small guards, big guards, or a combination of both. All of these factors are things the player should consider when deciding to use fight or flight. This approach leads the player to having just enough differentiation in guard encounters that it doesn't get stale over the course of a 10-12 to 12 hour game. So all in all, I think combat is satisfactory, nothing spectacular, but it certainly wasn't the focal point of the game. The gang is more than capable of holding their own in fights, but they certainly prefer to move around in the shadows. My only complaint with the dynamic between playable characters and guards is that I wish guards would do a little bit more to pursue you once you alert them. They give up so quickly that a lot of the time you can just run past them without ever having to fear them chasing you for too long, and that defeats the point of having them roaming the overworlds. Oh, and one other thing, when patrolling, it's kind of crazy that enemies can't see you sometimes. They really do have tunnel vision, especially the flashlight guards. Anyway, we beat 50 guards, and Murray gets thrown in solitary. Our next goal is to eliminate the Contessa's giant attack robot. Reaching the next mission marker can be a challenge of sorts, as only Sly is capable of entering the prison. There's no obvious front door that is accessible, so that means a lot of super stealth moves are required to reach hidden entrances. I love this tough to navigate world design because it shows how capable Sly is of traversing any terrain. After some convincing from Bentley that a threat does actually exist, Sly must reach and turn off five lightning poles that are drawing away strikes from the robot. The hope is that by turning them all off, the robot will get hit by a force of nature and have its circuits fried. This mission is a pretty lackluster one, but still well designed. Lightning strikes will hit at timed intervals, but will only strike one active tower at a time. That means that at the beginning, when five are operational, things are pretty easy for Sly as the chance of him being around one that's drawing in lightning is only 20%. As you turn off more and more of them though, that percentage climbs until it culminates with the last pole receiving 100% of the strikes. It increases the challenge naturally while not compromising on the narrative, which is excellent. And by the time you reach the last few poles, it's good to get Sly off the platform until a strike hits and use that window of time to turn another level. Like I said, it's nothing revolutionary, but it furthers the gameplay experience for the better. Dealing with the prison's security system is on tap next, and it's a joint effort between Sly and Bentley. Bentley needs to place bombs all along the bridge while Sly protects him in this effort. The problem for Sly is that he lacks Murray's raw power, meaning an element of stealth will be necessary. Sly breaks statues all over the bridge and takes their place in order to stealth kill enemies as Bentley works on placing the bombs. If you thought these guards were kind of brain dead before, this mission won't alleviate that feeling. I mean, it's just kind of hard to believe they wouldn't notice that this is a flesh and blood person. It's not stone like all the others. Anyway, it's a pretty standard mission. Stealth kill flashlight guards and take smaller enemies head on. Easily one of the more forgettable missions in the entire game, but perhaps one that would inspire a mechanic in the third game. Code capture is up next, and Bentley needs Sly's athletics and photography skills to get a sample of the Contessa's encryption algorithm. I really appreciate the dynamic between Sly and Bentley throughout the series. 
Sly is a field man true and true. He may not know why he's doing something, but he's going to get the job done if that's what Bentley tells him to do. This job is a platforming challenge that sees the player having to pickpocket guards, use their keys to set off alarms, and then snag photos of the codes. It's an exceptional job and one of the more memorable missions across the entire game because it incorporates all three of Sly's central mechanics into one goal. He has to use pickpocketing to get the keys from the guards, he has to use platforming to reach the correct leverage point so that he can take the photos, and then of course he actually has to snag a picture of the codes themselves. Every part of his gameplay design is utilized in a great way. The true challenge really comes from identifying the best vantage point in order to snag pictures, and that shows you have to plan this out. It may take multiple attempts your first time and challenges your understanding of the stage design. I do however notice that once again the screen clips into the number that's being shown off on these screens, which is definitely a graphical glitch. At the beginning of the video, I said this game doesn't hold up the best from a performance perspective, and this is another small example. Anyway, Code Capture is one of the best missions in the game from the perspective of Sly's mechanical features, and it's my personal favorite job of Chapter 4. It's time to mix it up with the Contessa and pickpocket her until we have a full regiment of tank controls and operational keys. Sly is tasked with relieving the spider of this equipment. Sounds kind of easy, right? Well, she has a full regiment of guards following her at all times that we'll have to deal with in order to get close. The best way to go about this is to distract each guard, one at a time, and pick them off before making your move on the Contessa. This mission is essentially an evolution of Follow Dimitri and Leading Rajan, with the addition that you'll have to get in close to Contessa while she's fully conscious. The thing that stands out most to me is how the game builds some adrenaline when it comes time to take out guards and pickpocket the Contessa. If she catches even a small glimpse of a disturbance, she will run full speed towards you about one and a half times faster than you can sprint. It's terrifying realizing she's been alerted and having to full sprint away at all costs just hoping she doesn't discover you. It's very atmospheric, especially considering she can leap onto the building rooftops, which takes away a location you'd normally associate with safety. It's a great atmospheric mission that really challenges the player and keeps you on the edge. Finally, all our hard work as Sly pays off as we're able to take a chance on freeing Murray in Operation Trojan Tank. After blowing our way into the prison in an uneventful fashion, Sly must gain access to the guard control tower by platforming through the prison. To me, it's kind of striking that there's no sequence of combat, having to fight off a ton of guards, considering we literally just used explosives to enter a prison, but then again, I guess it can be explained away by saying we cut the security systems in the Disguise Bridge mission. Flipping the switch up here allows us to enter solitary confinement where Murray is being housed, and needless to say, he's in rough shape. What's that sound? Angry! Get gone! I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Tip me over and I'll smash up everything! Ah! The effects of spice consumption are being heightened by hypnotic machines that the Contessa has built. Sly has to dip into some more platforming skills while Bentley is tasked with hacking into the laser defense system to shut off the beam stopping Sly from progressing. Turning on all the hypno machines sends Murray into a craze and causes him to bust down the door, which I must say is the least dangerous door crashing scene I've ever seen. It practically just opens untouched. What the hell is that? We then use Murray's strength against the machines we just activated to destroy them, which leads to a nice moment of reunion between our characters before we're forced to go after the Contessa, who does eventually escape. Uh, my head! Who? What? Is this heaven? Sorry, pal. You're no angel. Just take a few deep breaths and try to center your thoughts. Okay. 
I'm going through this all rather quickly, but don't get me wrong, I do really enjoy this operation, especially the hacking part as Bentley. It's a step up in difficulty from anything we experienced in Train Hack. The outro cutscene is once again narrated by Bentley as he details the moments leaving the city, but also the weeks that followed the prison escape. It was great! The gang had been reunited and it was all because of me! Even the van ride out of town was like a party! Furry had to pull over twice because he was laughing so hard! But despite all the jokes, I think something had changed. Since childhood, the three of us had never been apart. And our recent isolation gave us all pause for thought. The gang's forced isolation from one another gave them time to realize just how important they were to one another, and after a lifetime of never being separated, this instance strengthened their sense of family. The Cooper gang is shown to be so much more than just a gang, but instead a family of three who care about each other above all the rest. Despite not having a clockwork part to steal, and little interaction with the main villain, Jailbreak is able to overcome these factors and remain one of the best chapters in the game, and that's due to how much it focuses on the camaraderie between our heroes and puts those dynamics above all the others. A Tangled Web is where the different actors and groups of the main plot really start to collide head on. This chapter features a war between the newly outed Contessa and Constable Neela, while the Cooper gang plans to use the feud to snag the clockwork eyes from the spider hypnotist. She's using the ancient bird eyes for their hypnotic effect in order to manipulate her patients, which proves very easy to do. A Tangled Web is the most divisive chapter in the entire game because it houses some of the title's most complete and memorable missions, as well as some of its worst. This chapter will also conclude Act 2 of the story with a dramatic operation and a rescue, but we'll get to that. First things first, it's time to do some reconnaissance work as Sly, and they've expanded this system into the open hub worlds themselves, starting here in Chapter 5. The photography work becomes more than just attempting to uncover the Contessa's use of the clockwork eyes, but instead to better understand the elements that make up the hub world and how they can be used to the Cooper gang's advantage. This means grabbing photos of Neela's headquarters, the newly acquired tanks that signal all-out war, and some vehicles like a boat and a blimp. From there, it's time to head into the tallest tower to do the standard recon work that we've come to know and love. Inside, we find Inspector Fox being held captive by the Contessa, and she's shackled to a bench in the same way that this story resigns her to the bench. Outside of Thieves in Time, Carmelita's influence on the overall story of each game has been kept relatively low, only appearing during the game's climax and at random intervals throughout the rest of the story. Her role in Band of Thieves is at a series low, as she's forgotten in the first act to emphasize Neela, and now in the second act she's being held captive. Carmelita is a character based on getting things done, arresting criminals, and continuing her search for Sly, but in Band of Thieves, it's the opposite. Carmelita doesn't get things done, things get done to Carmelita. She's a casualty of the story and never feels like an integral part of it until a forced attempt at the end that felt even less natural than the finale of Sly 1. Anyway, she's being held against her will, and after grabbing some photographs of the clockwork eyes, a computer terminal, the Contessa's elite shadow guard, and the terrifying and indestructible mind shuffler, it's back to the safe house to cook up a plan. Before we jump into our next mission, let's talk about the music of Sly 2 Band of Thieves, and my overall consensus of it would be that while it's good, it fails to live up to the music of the original.
I think the main reason for why I don't find the music of Sly 2 to be more memorable is because most of it has to serve as background music that you'll be hearing a lot of. In Sly 1, levels were short enough that the music could take some risks and be a little bit more out there, whereas in this game, you'll be spending a few hours listening to the same track across each hub world. Peter McConnell replaced Ashifa Keek for the second go-around, and would actually remain on for the rest of the series, and his compositions end up being very cyclical and repetitive, which isn't necessarily bad, despite that normal connotation. I think any track can start off well, but after hearing it on repeat for two to three hours, it does get stale, and I think that's the issue this game's music suffers from more than anything else. Now I should specify, each kind of like separate area, like when you're going into a building or something, and some of the actual levels and jobs themselves do have their own themes that are distinct and separate from the hub worlds. However, they all still kind of blend together and feel very samey. It's more about setting the mood than it is being memorable. The pieces aren't as in your face, but they still feel appropriate to each setting, like how the Contessa's levels feature a lot of pieces from the organ, an instrument often associated with this kind of dark atmosphere, or how Dimitri's boss fight features music from his disco. The music is also somewhat dynamic as it does change its tempo and sounds during combat encounters while dropping back off once the character reaches safety. Look, I'm not the best at talking about video game music, I say that a lot, but at the end of the day, I just don't think this soundtrack is as iconic as the first, but that doesn't default it to being terrible. It's just different from the first. Sure, some tracks stand out to me, but only the main menu theme remains iconic to me. In fact, that is my favorite track from the whole series. Um, anyway, it just complements the thiefy atmosphere in the right ways, but this soundtrack is not much more than that. Anyway, this footage you've been seeing comes from the next job that's called Ghost Capture, where Sly has to do just that, capture ghosts. Wanting to dip into the thiefiness that's often associated with characters like Indiana Jones or Lara Croft, and the idea of tomb raiding in general, this chapter features several jobs where the gang has to go deep into underground crypts. They're all filled with the usual traps you'd expect, and I think they make for a good addition. It's another classic concept you think of when thinking about thieves. This mission itself, though, is one of the least likable in the game, certainly the worst one involving photography. After freeing ghosts, Sly must capture them by taking pictures of them. Don't ask me how this works, Bentley just says it does, and so it does. Taking pictures of the ghosts ends up being pretty annoying though, because they're constantly flying in and out of buildings, and the Binakikam's controls aren't as fine-tuned and fluid as they should be to capture moving targets. It leads to a lot of instances of waiting for a ghost to fly back into the open after missing a shot from not zooming and adjusting fast enough. It's mechanically frustrating, and the only saving grace for the mission is being able to platform around the hub world as Sly trying to find vantage points. All in all, a pretty weak mission for this game. Luckily, the next mission, Mojo Trap Action, is one of the most memorable across the entirety of the Sly franchise, and it's a mission for Bentley to take on. In order to put the Contessa's Mind Shuffler out of commission, we're going to need a bad Mojo Bomb filled with a magical energy. Sly 1 dipped into the supernatural in Miss Ruby's world, and it's good to see it making a comeback in the sequel. So we're tasked with protecting the Collector from taking any damage. The problem? 
We're playing as the weakest character in the game. The solution? Ancient crypt traps designed to kill with a vengeance. In each of the four crypts you'll visit, there's a series of levers that activate traps, and you'll have to use these to keep enemies at bay and away from you. The first one is simple, with only one trap that resets very quickly, meaning that it's not too difficult to grasp. The second introduces multiple traps, but has enemies travel in a linear way so that you can still avoid getting overwhelmed too quickly. The final two take the training wheels off though and force you as a player to adapt quickly as the levers don't always reset fast enough for you to avoid all enemy encounters. It leads to a lot of tension and it's a mechanic that won't be repeated for the rest of the game, making this mission feel rather unique. It's frantic and chaotic in the best ways as you dance around the crypts doing everything you can to avoid a fox's mace. You'll see this mission pop up a ton when people rank their favorite levels throughout the series, and it's for a good reason. It's a fantastic job that introduces a fresh gameplay experience while demanding a lot from the player. For the first time since Operation Wet Tiger, we will be starting a mission as Murray. Kidnap the General is the shortest job in the entire game and can be completed incredibly quickly. You're tasked with carrying the General back to the safe house and using him as a projectile against guards along the way in order to get there safely. However, you can just do a full out sprint past all the guards and complete this chore in under one minute, which is what I did in this playthrough. The level wasn't intended to be played like this, but the path of least resistance is so straightforward and so easy to use that it's hard not to do that. Kidnap the General ends up being one of the more forgettable missions in the game simply because the ability to cheese it is unreal and doing so means it's over very, very quickly. Luckily, we get another instance of a dud mission being followed up by a stud mission with stealing voices. This, just like Code Capture, is one of those sweet missions where all of Sly's best moves are put to the test. We have to steal some broadcasting equipment from the Contessa's crypts and use them to give fake commands to Neela's tanks. This means busting into three separate crypts that are all locked up and require keys to access. So you'll cycle through platforming, pickpocketing, and sneaking your way across the streets of Prague. The guards you have to pickpocket are also set up in interesting ways, puzzles almost, that are designed to test your reflexes as sly. For instance, the first set of guards features one man that occasionally turns clockwise while another guard walks counterclockwise around him. There's only a small window to get in and get both keys, and oftentimes you'll have to do that with two approaches or more. But sometimes you're sitting up on a vantage point and plan things so well that you pickpocket both guards without ever having to flee, and it's immensely satisfying because you're pulling off incredible acts of athleticism with ease. You feel like a master of the game, and Sly's abilities are all the more felt because of it. The crypts are also quite a distance away from the guards that you're required to alleviate of their keys, meaning you get a chance to explore the map, and it's easily the most vertical one of the game. That means a lot more climbing as Sly, and doing those awesome platforming tricks like transitioning a hook swing into a rail slide. It's just one of those missions where every component of a character's gameplay comes together in a unique way with its own set of challenges, and it makes this one of the best jobs in the game. But just like that, it's right back to the bottom of the barrel for arguably the worst mission in the history of Sly Cooper, and it's called Tank Showdown. Oh, ow. Oh. Here we go. The seat's gotta go back farther than this. Oh. 
Okay, guys, I'm in a tank. This Murray mission sees us take control of a tank. And by take control, what I actually mean is struggling indefinitely to comprehend how this affront to machinery handles. We get a first person view of the tank and control it with the left and right analog sticks. Pressing forward on both sticks sees the tank move onward, while pressing them back makes the tank go in reverse. Strange, but simple enough. The difficulty in maneuvering comes when trying to change your direction as you're meant to push one stick forward and the other backward to turn left and right and it doesn't feel natural at all. I think they wanted to get some awesome tank warfare, but the controls are so restricting that you basically just set up shop and a vantage point and try to pick off the opposing tanks while having a bit of cover to hide behind. It's either that or you just tank the damage, no pun intended, and try to find health pickups nearby in order to survive. It's not fun, it's not well implemented, and it doesn't give the player the intended experience. Instead, it's an exercise in frustration as you seek out the easiest way to complete the challenge, cheesing it almost. And as we all know, one of the quickest ways to get pulled out of a game and the experience it's giving you is feeling like you have to cheese through a section to get back to the natural flow of the title. And the worst part of it all? This will make an appearance in the operation of this chapter and be even worse than this. To wrap up this set of missions, it's back to Bentley for a deep dive into more crypts. In order to free Carmelita, we have to power up the computer terminal by hacking into some more systems. The catch is that in order to do this, we have to use an old acid battery to power up the terminals, which means taking no damage in the crypts that are crawling with medieval ouch machines. It's a challenging mission because the platforming does require some quickness and some timing to overcome, and the hacking minigame also escalates as they progress, culminating with a new type of enemy that can do some serious damage if you aren't careful. It's a very good mission, but the thing that I want to discuss here is the camera of Sly 2. Because while it's good 95% of the time, that other 5% can make things really annoying. In Sly 1, I felt like the camera served its purpose for navigating and platforming, but not for searching for clue bottles since you could only move it on the x-axis. That system obviously wouldn't have worked in the sequel, and so we get access to that sweet, sweet y-axis. And most of the time it functions just fine, but it has a pesky habit of getting caught up on things, especially walls. This problem really makes itself known in this mission, as it will frequently get stuck in the narrow staircases and result in Bentley moving forward without the camera following along. And in a mission where you can't take damage and platforming obstacles are so prevalent, this can be a serious issue. The best cameras in games are the ones that we'd never take notice of, because that means they don't give off any sort of issues but that can't be said for this one in Sly 2. It works well in the open hub world spaces, but inside some of the smaller areas, it can be a nuisance. Before we get into our next big heist, I wanted to discuss the power-ups we can use throughout the game. So just like Sly could in the original game, here each member can unlock power-ups to be used which drains the item bar that's located below the health bar. Recovering health also recovers this item bar. Power-ups in Sly 2 can be acquired in one of two ways. The first is the direct route of buying them from the safe house, while the second is collecting every clue bottle in a stage and getting to the villain's safe. My issue with this power-up system remains true of the same system in Sly 1. Because power-ups are optional, they can't ever be too useful beyond very specific situations and can never be required unless outright told that they will be. 
The game does make you buy two of them throughout the adventure, the alarm clock and the paraglider, but this isn't a hindrance if you spend some time pickpocketing guards of their loot along the way. And as a side note, I love piling up this huge amount of loot on ThiefNet and selling it all in one money-making swoosh. That's just so satisfying. Anyway, the rest of the power-ups aren't mandatory, except for the two I mentioned, and so they end up feeling like afterthoughts. Since you unlock new power-ups with each new chapter, I can't show you all of them here. That being said, I can show you that many of them are designed simply to make combat easier. Bentley gets access to a move that shrinks enemies, making them easier to kill, and an assortment of throwable bombs to do damage or sleep enemies from range. Murray gets access to Flame Fist and a fiery flop that kill in one hit, but it's kind of pointless for a character who already kills in two hits. And finally there's Sly who gets a one hit KO move in the form of an electric strike and the ability to trick guards into attacking one another alongside of others. And again, that's just a small assortment of the moves you can unlock, but most of them are designed to ease combat, which that makes you less likely to fear getting caught by guards, which is kind of antithetical to being a thief. Most of the time you will forget you even have these power-ups unless you are specifically testing them out or messing around. The far more useful power-ups are the movement-based ones, like being able to jump as Murray while holding someone or throwing bombs farther as Bentley. These ones at least feel practical. The Murray jumping one especially helped in the Kidnap the General mission. Overall though, these power-ups are either misguided encouragers of combat that you'll forget even exist, or they're passive abilities that you will forget about once you acquire them. This is the curse of optional power-ups. They can't ever be too useful, just gimmicky. Operation High Road contains the most amount of unlikable mechanics, making it the worst operation in the game. It starts off simple with Murray lowering the castle defenses, Bentley calling in an attack using the voice modulator, and Sly paragliding them to the blimp. Once inside the re-education tower, Bentley hacks the computer terminal and frees Carmelita who clears out the Contessa. I'm not sure why the spider's running though when Inspector Fox has the accuracy of a stormtrooper. I get it, she was locked in place for a day, but seriously? That's your best shot? Come on. Anyway, while working to get the clockwork eyes down, Neela shows up and steals one of them, subtly hinting at a deeper connection as she mumbles how one eye should be enough for the old bird. One should be enough for the old bird. Sly, to the dismay of Bentley, gives chase. It's here where we get our final chase Neela mission of the game, and just like the others, it's not great. The other ones are just boring, but this one is frustrating because one of the final jumps is so easy to screw up. Every time I play this game, I mess up and forget to double jump here and have to redo the whole sequence, which never feels good. Eventually, Neela gets caught in a web and Sly prepares to face off against the Contessa. Meanwhile, Bentley is trying to escape with the other eye on the blimp and is forced to defend it with the turret. Out of all the turret sections in the game, this one is the least egregious as the hitboxes on the planes are a lot bigger and closer, making things much easier. Returning to Sly, we get what's really the saving grace of this operation, the dialogue between Sly and the Contessa as they debate over Clockwork's fate and the purpose of the parts. That eye belongs to me, and I want it back. No way. You think I'm crazy? Actually, on second thought, don't answer that. I really don't want your professional opinion. Not crazy, just stupid. You're an ignorant child playing dress-up in his father's legacy. 
Oh, I know all about you and the Cooper clan. Then you'll understand why this eye needs to be destroyed. Short-sighted fool! I've no interest in your narrow interpretation of morality. I'm above all that. Above good and evil. And you think I'd give the eye to someone that's above morality? Enough talk, insect. It will be just as easy, and more fun, to pry it from your cold, dead hand. One of the best things about Sly is that even though his profession is a criminal, he still carries a strong sense of morality. The boss fight is another underwhelming one where the Contessa only has two attacks. Hey, at least that's one more than Rajan. And those two moves are spam spiders and swing blindly at you. It's fairly easy to beat. This brings us back to Murray and Bentley. The blimp got shot down and explodes, which may leave you to think something serious happened to Bentley, but the game removes all tension immediately by having him pipe up during the Contessa fight. He's been kidnapped along with the Eye by Inspector Fox, and Murray has to free him by... <sighs> giving chase in the tank. This is where the tank controls seriously make themselves known as a true threat to your sanity. You have to hit the tank about five times before it escapes, and giving chase is a nightmare. Unlike the earlier mission that was untimed and saw tanks moving along the same route, this one removes those handicaps to make your life hell. Your best bet is to just shoot the tank as soon as you spawn and try to line up some hits while dragging yourself after her. If you fail, you have to watch the cutscene over and over again, which is annoying, and I remember as a kid failing this part like 20 times until finally I got lucky. It's dreadful, but it seems the developers knew this and were smart enough to make sure that they didn't bring these controls back at any point for the rest of the game. Anyway, Sly lets his guard down, and the Contessa gets the other eye, leading to one more fight between the duo. With the power of the clockwork eye, the Contessa can now briefly put Sly in a trance, but it's meaningless. That's because you can still dodge her attacks with ease, and falling off the platform doesn't cost you any health. Beating her wraps up this operation with you and the gang escaping with both clockwork eyes. We see that Neela is promoted for her efforts, and Carmelita is still on the run. Sly even gets a chance to help her escape, which he loves. It's kind of hard for me to believe she'd accept his help, but so be it. Give our lovers their moment, I guess. With that, we wrap up episode 5. It has a lot of great missions and a lot of poor ones, but luckily the conflict between the three distinct parties keeps the narrative interesting. It's not one of the better episodes in the game, but it's not terrible either. In fact, it doesn't surprise me when people rank this as one of their favorite episodes across the series, but to me, there's just far too many jobs within it that are either forgettable, easily cheesed, or straight up poorly designed. The next chapter is my personal favorite across the entirety of the Sly series, He Who Tames the Iron Horse. This serves as our introduction to Jean Bassan, the runner for the Claw Gang who is responsible for distributing spice across North America. Born in the 1850s, Bassan became obsessed with clearing land and making progress, but in an avalanche he was frozen until he thawed out in today's time and decided to continue his mission. He's pretty much an eco-terrorist and he has a ton of clockwork parts three of which we'll be nabbing here in episode 6. Despite this being one of the shortest chapters throughout the entire series, the thing that really sells it is that it's all about train heists. A stereotype for the genre, sure, but it just feels so natural and well implemented into this title. Before we dive in though, I quickly want to talk about the game's lighting because it's a component of the art design and graphics that I think have held up pretty well. This is a game from 2004, so it's not a marvel to look at by any stretch, but it's still good for what it is. It's held up decently. Each locale you visit is experienced during the nighttime, which explains away a lack of citizens for the most part. Now you may think being in the night would lead to a lot of overly dark levels, but that really isn't the case. 
Everything is well lit enough as to not obstruct player vision, while also not being overly bright to confuse these events for happening in broad daylight. Chapters 6 and 7 have the most well lit areas, but this makes sense considering the impact of the Northern Lights that play a crucial role in the game's plot. And after chapters 4 and 5 had the darkest and most oppressive atmospheres of the game, these next couple episodes will lighten things up a bit. It fits in thematically too, considering the last two episodes were about the group being split up and about, you know, all-out warfare between Interpol and the Claw Gang, and those were grim moments, and they were enhanced by the darkness of the levels. But now, the mood is much less severe, so the lighter skies feel appropriate. Our first task is to figure out just what Bisan is doing with the clockwork parts, and so Bentley decides to encourage Sly to walk directly into his cabin to find out. You know, I get it, Sly is the master thief, but walking right in the front door to the lumberjack's lair is nothing short of immersion shattering. Anyway, listening in, we can overhear a conversation between Bassan and the final member of the Claw Gang, Arpeggio. All right, I'm on it. Hello, Arpeggio here. Salutations, Mr. Arpeggio. Y'all got time to shoot the breeze? Of course, but you chum always. Although, must we communicate through that dreadful speakerphone? Yeah, I can think better while my legs move. Pumps blood to your brain. Yes, of course, one must keep blood in one's brain. But do tell, is there some pressing matter you'd like to discuss? First off, are you still a coming on schedule to get that Northern Lights battery? Yes, we're well underway. My blimp should arrive at the end of the week. Bullseye. For a second, when are you gonna give me a look-see at that clockwork brain of yours? I'd sure like to buy it off you. Be song, you covetous troglodyte. You already got the lion's share of the parts. Would you take my meager portion of the robotic bird for your own and strip me of all my earthly pleasures? Easy there, partner. You're all up in a lather. It's just that I found some real use for the clockwork parts I got. Why, I put three of them in the engines of my best trains. With those robotic doohickeys feeding the fire, them trains will run all night and all day. I call them my iron horses. Of course, I gotta keep the plans hidden. Stuffed him in my three trophy bass. Sounds like you're making capital use of your share of the robotic loot. But for now, the clockwork brain stays with me on the blip. Although, when I arrive to pick up the Northern Knight's battery, I might be persuaded to give you a peek. That'll do fine. By the way, you ready to giddy up into Perry for the final hoedown? Yes! The blimp's hypnotist wavelengths conform to the specs drawn up by the Contessa, and Dimitri, before his unfashionable capture, did a bang-up job of distributing spice through his nightclub. Sounds like all you're missing is some northern light electricity. You're correct, sir. Yours is the final piece to the puzzle, the missing link. Once the battery is aboard, nothing will stand in the Claw Gang's way. Paris will be ours. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I guess I'll be seeing you at the end of the week. Right. Farewell, me song. Stiff up a lip. Ta-ta. You don't have to listen in, it's optional, but doing so pretty much spells out what their intentions are. They want to take over Paris, and will be using the influence of Spice to do so, although the specifics are left vague. I really appreciate this dialogue, as eavesdropping is a natural fit into a game about thieves. It also gives us some more insight, but, like I said, it's totally skippable on subsequent playthroughs. We nab some pictures of the Iron Horse train routes after overhearing that Bassan is using the clockwork lungs and stomach to keep the trains running 24-7. I don't really know how that works, but it just does, I guess. Also, you know, the clockwork heart, I get that. I understand how that would function as a super pump for Rajan. That makes sense. But lungs and a stomach? Seriously? Also, who got the clockwork colon? That's what I want to know. Who's putting the clockwork esophagus to use? Questions that never get answered, I'm afraid. Anyway, the blueprints to the trains are also conveniently being stored in each of Bassan's three cabins, so it's time to get a hold of them as well. 
It's a good way of getting the player to explore this new map, considering that all of these cabins are on separate ends of it. Finally, we scale the mountain to reach a satellite capable of tracking the trains, and with that, our first job here is complete. It's a fine introduction to a legendary chapter. Our next job is called Spice in the Sky, which I like to think is a reference to the song Spirit in the Sky, which, if so, nice. Anyway, the point of this mission is to unlock the caboose hatches on each of Bassan's three Iron Horse trains. In order to do this, Sly has to gather denatured spice gas from the spice balloons that exist for some reason. It's better not to think about the logic behind this mission, just go with it, it's a good one. It's one of those rare missions that challenges you to control the paraglider as you have to collect five batches of spice before landing directly on a caboose. Hitting a balloon propels you further up into the sky, and you have to use that leverage to your advantage because all of the balloons are at different altitudes, meaning it's best to plan out a route. And even landing directly on a caboose can be challenging as you really have to line up your angle and fall distance to stick it just right. And doing so leads to these awesome and super satisfying explosion scenes where Sly jumps off the caboose as the spice explodes, blowing the hatch wide open for the gang. The paraglider really controls pretty well too, which is good, because failing to hit a caboose more than two or three times because it was hard to control would have led to a lot of frustration, but luckily, that isn't how it goes down. Our next job is one that comes out of nowhere, really. Murray gets captured by Carmelita, who wants to clear her name by turning over the Cooper gang. Kind of an evil move, considering we literally just helped her escape Prague in the last chapter. I've mentioned it already, but I think the handling of Carmelita is one of the weaker parts of the game. She's really just used as a device to push the plot forward. Anyway, Sly has to follow her and pickpocket the keys in order to free Murray. It's pretty standard gameplay at this point. Because of that, I want to spend this time talking about the game's voice acting, because it addressed my key concern from the first title, while also taking some very minor steps back in other ways. In Sly 1, the voice acting ranged from alright to pretty good across the cast of heroes and villains. That is except for Kevin Miller's Sly, who often sounded uninterested or bored. And not to mention, Sly 1 had issues with sounds overpowering the noise from voices, which often led to Sly's voice sounding muffled. In Sly 2, though, Miller delivers a much more pronounced take on the character with a grounded voice that never has a hint of panic. I tried to put it all out of my mind. This claw business was spiraling out of control, and I knew that my gang was at the center of it. We'd be back in action soon enough, but for now, well, we just laid low for a while. Sly is a cool and collected hero, and his voice work reflects that very well in Sly 2. Constable Neela, you look lovely this evening. I'm sorry, do I know you? I used to chase after you back in Paris. Paris? Sly Cooper? You aren't by any chance here to turn yourself in. Old Ironsides would fall out of her dress. As good as that sounds, how about a dance first? Crime. I haven't stolen anything. Yet. That's not to say it's all perfect. Some of the lines still end up feeling a little bit hollow. However, Miller's performance has a more serious inflection at just the right moments that makes Sly feel more a part of the events taking place instead of just being a guy that sounds like he's muttering in the background. Deal. You and the rest of the Claw Gang have to be stopped. Clockwork will never again see the light of day. I'd say the best voice actor continues to be Matt Olson as Bentley. He talks with a nasally voice that's associated with genius and nerdy characters across the entertainment media. Though well, statistically improbable, I had to face the facts. Neela had betrayed us. My teammates were captured, and I was all alone. While intellectually inferior, Sly and Murray had always been a rich source of sociological interest. 
He's able to convey more emotion through the character too, more so than anyone else. He's scared while in Paris, he's terrified when the blimp crashes in episode 5, and he's calculated and calm during most briefings. Thanks to Sly's efforts, we now know the location of all three of the local clockwork parts. Two lugs and a stomach. John Besson has grafted each piece to the engine in one of his iron horse trades. Chris Murphy's Murray is also well done as he interjects a much more tough persona into the voice given the character's growth into the team's source of muscle. Citizen, I hope you weren't harmed by my meteoropic entrance. No, Murray, I, I kept it a safe distance. Good, good. The Thunderflop knows neither friend nor foe, only destruction. He was forced to evolve the character's voice for this game instead of just refining it, and I think he did a really good job. As for our villains, they're not quite as zany and over-the-top as in Sly 1, and so their voices are toned back to a more serious tone, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but maybe a bit samey throughout the adventure. Dimitri is of course the fan favorite, given his incorporation of strange improv lingo, but I guess that is more of a credit to the writers than the voice actor. Still, David Scully did a great job with that character. If you've ever watched any video about the Sly series on YouTube, you know that Carmelita had a different voice actor in every game, and to be honest, I don't think any of them are really that great. On a personal level, I like the actress from the first game the most. Here in Sly 2, Alicia Glidwell sounds very plain, which doesn't help make a character memorable, especially one who is already on the outskirts of the script. Sly, for once, let's cut the flirty chit-chat and get down to business. She also plays Neela as well, who, again, I don't think she delivers an excellent performance there either. It's just alright. Now, the actress did have to dig in as the character takes on a crazier tone later in the story, so I will give her props for that. So, the Contessa wants war, eh? Perhaps it's time I purchase a little air power. A few bombers should put that old charlatan in her place. Looking at the bigger picture, though, our cast of three really stepped up their voice performances for Sly 2, and that's what matters most since the heroes are the ones we are often spending the most time with. This time around, the villains just aren't quite as memorable as I would have liked. Like, the overly expressive villains of the first game had voices that I can recall easily, while the same can't be said for all of the Band of Thieves villains like Rajan and Jean Bassan. This game's story went for a different tone when compared to the first. This one is much more grounded and realistic, so it does make sense that you're going to have less comic book-like performances, which does explain why the villains are the way they are in this game. To wrap this up, overall thoughts on the voice acting, very good. Especially Sly, Bentley, and Murray. And as for the villains... Good for what it is. A different approach because it's a different kind of game. The time has arrived for a train robbery. Bentley boards Iron Horse 1 and has to work his way up towards the front of the train, dodging guards and security platforms while being sure to destroy tons of spice shipments along the way. What can I say? I really like this mission. It has some decent setups for Bentley to use his limited platforming skills while also making strong work of his sleep darts. The challenges are appropriate for his skill set to tackle. My one criticism, though, would be that this should really be a mission for Sly, given he's much more graceful and agile, while nothing on this train really demands Bentley's brains or demolition skills. Sly could easily handle the combat encounters with smaller guards while avoiding the encounters with flashlight guards, so I really don't get it. It seems that they just wanted Bentley to do more in this chapter, and so he's the one that gets to board the first train for that reason alone. Still, it sets up the player's expectations for how these train missions will play out. They're a series of confined platforming and combat challenges that must be overcome in a very limited space. It's exciting and different and fits perfectly into the player's preconceived notion of a train robbery.
It's right back to Bentley for another mission though, as we're asked to destroy the defense turrets and systems on board of Iron Horse number two, so that when Sly does go in, he doesn't have to worry much about high-tech repellents. This is an RC chopper mission, and it's the best the title has to offer. We're now given access to a front-mounted cannon that shoots forward, meaning it's capable of both dropping bombs and shooting forward, which opens things up to a lot of new combat challenges for this style of gameplay. And it shows too, this mission can be pretty challenging. Even I took some damage after playing through this game a ton of times. You have to keep track not only of what is right in front of you, but also what's below you, and these turrets that shoot up towards you are the trickiest things to dodge. You have to do a lot of bobbing and weaving to make it through safely, and when you do, it feels good. The final train robbery will also call upon these skills again, so it's good to give players a chance to learn the new controls here before being asked to show mastery of it in the heist. It's up to Murray to free this handcart by manipulating the forces of nature to break steel. We'll do this by using some local bear cubs to attract an aggressive mother to this location to break it down. It's here where I want to talk in depth about Murray's gameplay, much in the way I did with Bentley during the wall bombing mission in Chapter 4. Murray is easily the weakest character from a mechanical design perspective. Ironic, I know, since he's the strongest member of the group by far. For the most part, Murray's tasks revolve around one of two things, combat or carrying things. He's able to kill pretty much any guard in the game with two hits, meaning the optimal strategy when playing as him is to just mash square until everything is dead. Point the camera and punch becomes his default moveset, and it's the most worthwhile part of his contribution to the gang's plans, but for us as players, it's pretty brain dead to handle. It's just not very involving for the player to engage with. It's button mashing through and through. The game is also reluctant to throw more than a handful of guards at you at once, meaning that we never get a true sense of Murray's immense power. I mean, even in the mission where he has to take down 50 foxes in the prison, you're still never asked to deal with more than three or four enemies at any given moment. I would have loved to see some missions where Murray gets put up against like 30 enemies at one time who are a tad more docile. Then his power could have been felt as you punch through all of them. Now, obviously, there was a design limitation working with the PS2 versus what we have now, so that maybe wasn't a real possibility for them. However, it's still something I would have loved to see. And with what we have now, Murray's true power and strength never really materializes in a gameplay mechanic that the player can truly feel. To exacerbate this problem, Murray's other primary function, carrying things, also doesn't make him seem like the powerhouse that we're told he is. Most of the time, he is just carrying small things like tiny guards or logs, and in the first chapter, newspapers. Literal newspapers. Come on, I could do that, you could do that, anyone could carry a newspaper. He's not strong because he's carrying around the Daily Bugle. Why is Murray special for that? To make matters worse, Carrying things from one point to the other isn't interesting or engaging. It's just monotonous, especially if you don't buy the mobility power-ups for Murray. They try to spice things up by making some of these objects indestructible projectiles to take out guards with while you make your way to the objective. But most of the time, though, you don't even have to interact with a single guard and can run away from any encounter, making the whole projectile notion obsolete. It's pretty clear that the developers knew Murray wasn't going to be as fleshed out as the other two characters from a gameplay perspective, and despite overhauling his involvement from the first title, they still couldn't figure out much to do with him. As we will see, this is kind of reflected in the number of missions he gets all to himself throughout the game. Trust me, he's at the lowest out of any of them. Don't get me wrong. I love Murray the character, it's just that his gameplay contributions don't quite match up with Sly's and Bentley's. I mean, the man can't even take a moving train to the face. 
how strong could he possibly be? It's time to nab the other clockwork lung by hopping aboard Iron Horse number two as Sly. Gliding down the rails while inching your way closer and closer to the objective remains exhilarating. This time around, the train is designed to test your stealth abilities by throwing a lot of flashlight guards at you. It's actually one of the rare situations where the insanity bomb power-up works really well to force guards into taking each other out. In fact, it's kind of a dominant strategy and allows Sly to get through with ease. This train is even shorter than the first, which is my one complaint about these sections. They're so fun, but you can complete both of them in like five minutes unless you're completely incompetent with the controls. With that done though, we do nab another piece of clockwork and shut down another one of Bassan's trains. The last Iron Horse train is about to become obsolete as we set our sights on the last clockwork part. This operation combines some sly platforming with Bentley's RC Chopper for the quickest operation in the game. Sly gets yet another chance to show off his athletic prowess by moving through the train undetected, even amongst Jean Bassan himself. Along the way, he shows off a lot of impressive athletic feats, none more so though than crawling under the train itself while latching onto a pipe. It's awesome. The first game did a great job of establishing this character's athleticism through gameplay, and this game continues that tradition in spades. Halfway through the ascent forward, Neela shows up in an airplane of her own with her sights set on nabbing Clockwork's stomach. I love this banner between Sly and Neela, especially Sly's reaction to it towards his friends. Hey Koopa, thought I might find you here. Just can't stay away from these clockwork parts, can you? No, I just do it to meet exciting ladies like yourself. If you'd like some excitement, why not climb up on top of the train? I'm sure to get your heart pumping, maybe even show you my new ride. No thanks, Neela. I've seen enough already. What's the problem, Poodle? Afraid you can't take me on. Have to call up your little friends for help. Come in, little friends. Neela's got me pinned down. Any chance of air support? I've already launched the RC chopper. She won't know what hit her. Come on, Koopa. Let's play. It's clear through her dialogue and actions that she's seeking the parts for herself, even beyond what Interpool expects of her. This gives us our first and only vehicle-based boss encounter of the game, as we must use our RC chopper to defeat the British Indian cat. This is the final time we will control the RC Chopper in the game, and it goes off on a high note as this encounter is one of the best boss fights in the game, even if it is a huge departure from the traditional boss fight that we see across the series. It really challenges everything we've learned throughout the several missions that we've been controlling the RC Chopper. We have to dodge a lot of enemy planes and bullets, while also making sure to dish out as much damage on Neela as possible. Lighter. This is a... What? Oh no! Oh no! That was some fancy flying, little friend. Whatever you say, poodle. After Neela goes down, Sly continues pushing forward through the train's interior until Neela shows up again and Bentley must finish her plane off once and for all. Neela has the added moveset of ducking below the chopper this time to avoid its rapid-fire frontal cannons, meaning that you'll have to use bombs to take her out as well. Normally, she will switch positions a few times throughout the fight, but I peppered her with so many shots early on that she only dipped down below once. Those final moments of the fight are extra frantic though when both your health and hers are low, but eventually you prevail and send her off in a blaze of glory. Bentley then sacrifices the RC chopper to blow the stomach free, and with it in hand, the gang makes their escape. But I kind of hate that the chapter ends right here at this moment. I would have loved to see a section where we have to move backwards along the train, back towards the handcart and our friends. It may have felt a little bit anticlimactic after the boss fight, and I acknowledge that, but it would have extended some of the best parts of the entire series 
and of course I'm all on board for that, no pun intended. Making their escape, the Cooper gang is at a new high point. They have a majority of the clockwork parts and have overcome a lot of adversity thus far. This moment is the pinnacle height for good feelings throughout the entire adventure and it's a really nice moment for our heroes. Really, the only thing that's weighing down the good feelings for Sly is the fact that Carmelita still has an unknown future. She's still on the ropes with Interpol, and he's eager to find a way to clear her name without doing the simplest way of turning himself in. This concludes this chapter, and really, it leaves you wanting more. You want to spend more time on those trains and doing those heists and working your way through them. That was the best part of this chapter, and for me, it's really the best part of the entire series. The penultimate episode of the game ranks as one of its worst. Not because it's bad, just because it doesn't inspire with many new introductions to the gameplay. The story gets a boost from the chapter's end, but Bassan's lumberjack games feel like a forced idea. For many of the game's players, the third act of this title stumbles, and I somewhat share that opinion, although maybe not as concretely as most. I'm of course getting way ahead of myself with that, so let's rein it back in and see if Jean Bassan can leave a lasting impression in his second chapter. We learn that he is in possession of the Clockwork Talons, and that the introduction of the Claw Gang Spice is leading to a lot of violent outbreaks across North America, all the while the Northern Lights seem to be fading. Exiting the safe house, Bentley makes us aware of the final platforming component of the game, climbing with ice picks. He has somehow made Sly's cane capable of splitting into two separate parts. The problem with it though is that it doesn't really jive well with the other super stealth moves, leading to no real cases of interesting combinations between say like the ice climbing and the ninja spire jumps, or the ice climbing and the rail slide. There's one occasion at the chapter's end where it's combined with wall hooks, but it's kind of irritating there. So Bentley needs photos of the sawmill so that he can begin to forge a plan for how the trio will not only nab Bassan's clockwork talons, but also find a way to board Arpeggio's blimp while remaining undetected. They know that Arpeggio is in possession of the last clockwork piece, the clockwork brain, and so finding a way on board is another top priority. We nab some pictures of the local scenery before heading over to the lighthouse to eavesdrop on Jean Bassan. We get some photos of the lighthouse battery charger before hearing Bassan say that he will offer up the clockwork talons as a prize to attract new competitors in the Lumberjack games. And the Lumberjack games are basically an event that he hosts every year to boast his prowess as an eco-terrorist. This whole chapter then becomes about preparing the battery and finding a way to cheat in the Lumberjack games in order to win the Talons. Let me be blunt here, the best missions in this chapter revolve around the battery, while the more forgettable ones tend to be associated with the Lumberjack games. It just seems bonkers for Bassan to even offer up the talents as a prize, and even more crazy that the Cooper gang would actually think that he would be willing to part ways if he lost the competition. Not to mention, joining the Lumberjack games is basically exposing themselves directly to Bassan, and that would never be a smart idea. It's a huge lapse in Bentley's planning tendencies and the gang's overall approach to stealing. I'm making my point too quickly though for now, suffice it to say that the Lumberjack Games is what drags this chapter down the hardest. If you want a visual for how crafty and nimble Sly is, look no farther than Bear Cave Bugging, where he literally pickpockets tracking devices out of the mouths of bears. The first half of this job is the interesting part. It's about collecting those trackers by sneaking quietly through a bear's den where six hawking beasts are currently hibernating. One false step will wake the bears, meaning you have to be flawless with your movement. The second half of the job though isn't quite as exhilarating. You're just asked to place the trackers across the sawmill to form an array that Bentley can use to listen in on Bassan's conversations. 
It's a task you've done plenty of times now though, platforming across the map, and it doesn't really elevate the gameplay in any meaningful ways, which you'd kind of hope for as this game starts to wrap up. The first half starts off really strong, but with the second half being so basic, it ends up feeling like a standard Sly mission that we should have been playing at the beginning of the game, not towards the end. Our next job is a weird one. There's so many off-putting elements to it. There's, of course, the fact that the Moose Guards just have a stuffed head of one of their comrades laying around, and second, that Murray actually wears it as a disguise. I'm sorry, that's disgusting. This was a real person's head, and now you're wearing it like it's a freaking Halloween mask. Also, how do the guards not fall for this ruse? It's so clearly someone in disguise. It's a good mission, don't get me wrong, but it's a strange one without a doubt. Since this mission is going to contain one, what I really want to talk about here is how Sly 2 handles its mini-games, as this title's approach is a lot cleaner and better than the firsts. Sly 1 had a ton of mini-games to get treasure keys, but a lot of them weren't well implemented into the narrative. None more so than the level where you have to collect chickens so that a ghost can make soup. Yeah, that's real. That one just didn't make any sense and felt so out of place, while others like turret sections felt so antithetical to the thief experience. Here though, in Sly 2, things are contextualized much better. Most of the minigames feel like a natural part of the story and extensions of the character's normal capabilities. For example, the RC sections feel like technology that Bentley would develop and the turret sections always serve a greater purpose towards the final heist. Unlike in Sly 1, most of the minigames are encountered multiple times across the adventure instead of just one or two isolated incidents. This gives them time to expand and feel impactful instead of just being one-off gimmicks. Each one makes sense in the bigger picture and doesn't detract from the tone of the game, making them all worthwhile additions to Sly 2 in their own right. Except the tank. Fuck the tank. Next on the docket is Laser Redirection, a mission that hardcore fans of the series know as the level that you could glitch out. After finishing the game, you could return to this hub world and re-enter this sawmill and flip the switch. By pressing circle near it, the game would trick itself into thinking that this mission was active even though it wasn't. By leaving the sawmill and returning to the safe house, the game thought that you had abandoned the mission and projected the job start icon to restart it. And from here, you could trick the game and recomplete the rest of this level along with the final jobs of the chapter, including the final heist. I remember discovering that glitch as a kid and I loved it. I spent so many Sunday afternoons just exploiting this to finish out the chapter. I was a lot more fond of this episode as a kid than I am now. I even remember getting on CheatCodes.com and typing it up in the slide 2 section feeling cool as hell. Anyway, the mission itself sees Sly redirecting an industrial laser cutter to free an old log chopping guide from a block of ice. It seems like the internet could have been pretty useful in this situation instead of taking this route, but whatever Bentley, I guess it's all good. The mission sees Sly platforming through a new obstacle course within the sawmill, which is good new content, while redirecting the laser outside does kind of feel like a rehash of distributing the bear peg sensors across the map that we did a couple jobs ago. That component of it, the spreading of the laser, feels like repeated content, making this one of the weaker missions in the game. And to be fair, you could have done these two missions in inverse order and came to the same conclusion, that bear cave bugging was just a rehashing of laser redirection, but you know what, this is the order I did them in, so, so be it. It's back out with Sly for a mission that really teases you on being something better than it actually is. Sly is tasked with breaking into Bassan's lighthouse and allowing the other two in so that they can override the battery charger and stop the absorption of the northern lights. 
We can deduce that Bassan is using this battery to absorb the Northern Light's energy, and then once Arpeggio arrives, he's gonna pick it up, and the two will use the power to unveil their final plan and take over the world. But back to this mission specifically, having all the characters involved leads you to believe that it's going to be one of those cool missions that sees you controlling all the characters throughout it, but unfortunately, it's not. We just scale up the lighthouse's sly, go in through a hatch, and make our way down, and then back up. It's not terrible for what it is, but it's nothing special either. The best part is hitting these duck guards off as the red electricity surges upwards so that they get fried. It ends up being one of those missions though that I wish they put a little more time in and fleshed it out more. Like maybe have an alarm sound when Murray and Bentley enter and have the former beat up the guards and then have the latter hack into a terminal to allow the overcharge process to begin. As it is now, I finished this mission in under 5 minutes, which is really uninspiring. Sly says it best, the only way we could have wrapped this one up quicker is if this place had an elevator. Up, down, up, down. They should put an elevator in this place. Many of the other Lumberjack Games missions in this chapter aren't that great, but there is one exception. Old Grizzleface, the best Murray mission in the game. We're told to destroy oil mains by luring an old bear named Grizzleface to their location using fish. Once he gets there, he rips the steel structures apart. This is about the only mission in the game where Murray's ability to carry things is done in an interesting way, using fish to lure a beast around. Missions like Kidnap the General were so passive because it was about avoiding guards, but this mission sees you being able to torment guards, and it's all due to Murray's ability to throw things. There's a real power dynamic here, knowing that you can pretty much take out any guards already just as Murray, but with the bear's help, you pretty much run this entire land. It's a power trip and a relationship with nature, all rolled into one fantastic package. Luring the bear creates new gameplay scenarios that weren't possible before, making it a memorable and creative mission. I also like how the game does use some primal animals as third-party enemies throughout the title, whether it's the snakes in Rajan's world, the spiders in the Contessas, or the eagles and bears in Jean Bassan's. It just adds another element to the hub worlds that make them feel more alive. Our next goal is to drain the Northern Lights battery of its charge so that we can stow away on it to get into Arpeggio's blimp. In order to do this, Bentley must hack into the auto drive functionality of Bassan's boats and then ground the battery using hooks. It's a good mission where all three characters get involved in meaningful ways, even if you only control one of them. Just having the other two's extended presence throughout the mission is enough to elevate it over others. The hacking also takes it up a notch by introducing a new enemy, quick moving bombers that take multiple hits to kill. It's an upgrade to the standard tanks we've been fighting throughout the game, which is smart. It was time for an upgrade, and so we got one here. It's here where I'd like to take a little bit of time to discuss the game's sound design, because alongside of other parts of the presentation, it has held up pretty well since 2004. The reason for that is that because many of the sounds, whether it be a swing of a cane, a jump, or an enemy dying, they all have a cartoonish element to them that has survived the test of time. I was wondering what happened to that guy. Guess he just prefers to be frozen. <laughs> They immediately feel familiar, and since they weren't focused on creating the most realistic combat sounds of 2004, they've held up well while the technology has continued to advance. Clue bottles also give off that ting, ting, ting sound that is loud enough to allure you to their position. It starts out faint, but as you get closer, it grows louder, so that players can use a version of the game Hot and Cold to find all the clue bottles. It's a welcome touch in locating some of the more pesky clue bottles. 
My only gripe with the sound design overall is that there are a number of audio issues, like clue bottles continuing to make noises in cutscenes, or the sound of a fainted Rajan overlapping the audio in this cutscene. This may be exclusive to the remaster collection though, so I'm not willing to bash the game too hard for this. Overall, the sound design holds up well across the game, and it's because they decided to make most of the sounds cartoon-based. Our last duty before the big operation is to use the updrafts created by the destroyed oil rigs to glide over to an island to collect an eagle egg. This mission is short and simple, just hit all the updrafts, dodge the eagles, and then make your way back the short distance to the safe house without taking any damage. It's not nearly as involved as Spice in the Sky, making it feel like a step backwards in terms of missions centralized around the paragliding maneuver. At the beginning, Bentley comments on how one screw-up could turn Sly into barbecued raccoon, and it really reminded me of how much I enjoyed the banter between these two throughout the game. They've grown a sense of trust between them since the events of Sly 1, where Bentley was always siding with the numbers over Sly's abilities. Now the two are a lot closer and able to joke with each other about becoming barbecued raccoon or being ripped into hundreds of little turtle pieces. You're a good man, Bentley. Just make sure those traps don't rip you into a hundred little turtle pieces. Why'd you have to say that? These kind of quips still get a chuckle out of me to this day. Anyway, with this mission complete, it's time for the Lumberjack Games. That's right, it's time for the most artificial operation in the entire game, Operation Canadian Games. The Lumberjack Games are here, and the crew sets out to confront Bisson. It wasn't until this very playthrough, though, that I realized when Bentley tells Sly to stay in the back so that Bassan won't recognize him, he's referring all the way back to the ball in Episode 2, where he watched our raccoon hero dance the night away. Still, standing behind Murray and Bentley should in no way impede Bassan's ability to recognize Sly. On top of that, no one else shows up for the Lumberjack games, which just seems stupid considering how valuable the talents would be if they won. We get right into the games themselves now by having Murray chop through a log, which just means pressing X when the marker goes over the log. It's nothing difficult at all. We get a 10 and Bassan is up next, and Bentley has to plant the eagle egg on him in order to get the mother birds to attack him and screw up his swings. This Bentley section is restrictive, as we're forced into a slow walk, our jump is taken away from us, and we have to wait on platforms to line themselves up to cross while a timer ticks away. I understand why the timer is here, but I think that's what makes the limited mobility all the more frustrating, because you try to rush it and end up failing. It always feels tedious, and that remains true in this playthrough. Upon planting the egg, Bassan fails and his guards give him a score of zero. Pretty harsh considering the log appears almost fully chopped. But Bassan intimidates the guards into giving him all tens, and we move on to the ice wall climb. Getting to the top as Sly didn't prove to be too difficult, at least in this playthrough. I've had ones before where it's super annoying, but pulling Bassan off with the hooks as Murray is kind of challenging. You get very limited windows to actually tag him with a hook, and he gets up the mountain pretty fast. Pulling him off sees his judges give him a zero, which he then talks his way into tens. It's clear to the Cooper gang at this point that Bassan isn't afraid to cheat. I mean, having your guards as judges already is cheating enough if you ask me. Moving on, Bentley's challenge is log rolling, and he just has to stay afloat, which proves doable. Realizing that Bassan is cheating and that they're gonna lose, the gang has to improv a new plan, and they do so by luring the judges away from their post, taking their outfits, and giving Bassan zeros. Bassan recognizes that his judges have been replaced, and in a masterful and downright lucky throw of his cane, he knocks out all three of our heroes in one foul swoop. Seriously, this is some god-tier aiming to be able to do this. 
The throw itself does look pretty cheesy, but the game had to find a way to knock out our heroes for a while so that Passan could have time to ransack the Cooper HQ and sell all of the clockwork parts to Arpeggio. He reveals this piece of information to Bentley right before the next boss fight, and it feels like a real shock and a blow to our morale. Bentley, you okay? I can't see you from in here, but I heard the fall. I'll be fine. Just give me a moment to catch my breath. Well now, candy britches. I should have figured a puny turtle like you'd find a rat hole to squirm through. Well, I just dropped my glasses, had to come pick them up. I ain't like you, boy. I ain't stupid. When y'all were unconscious, me and my boys paid a visit to your hideout and found all them clockwork parts. Lucky thing, too. Arpeggio is willing to plunk down a king's ransom for the whole lot. I even threw in the talons. You sold all the clockwork parts? Arpeggio has them all? I wouldn't expect one of your kind to understand the finer points of commerce. You turtles are too stupid to know a woodcutter from a woodchuck. That's it! Time I showed you just how stupid we turtles really are. Sly, on my command! I hear ya. Prepare yourself, Missad! On guard! Okay, Walnut. Get ready for a smushing. Arpeggio has every single clockwork part, and that's not good. But there's a bigger task at hand right now. Bentley's first and only boss fight of the game. Clearly, our turtle friend wouldn't be much of a physical match for Bassan, and so he uses his brains to outwit him by luring him to different locations in the arena and calling for Sly to activate traps to do damage. I'm not sure how the community feels about the boss fights in general, but for me, this is one of the better ones. It makes sense contextually that Bentley would use his wits in a match against an intellectually inferior opponent. It also leads to some hectic gameplay as you have to avoid Bassan, his guards, and dynamite while your only form of defense is the traps. Your bowcaster is taken away from you, meaning you can't even swap things away. But I think that helps in keeping the fight frantic, which aligns with the tone of the moment. Eventually, Bentley prevails, and the gang has to haul it to the Northern Lights Battery to get on board and fly up to Arpeggio's blimp. It's here where the gang has time for the reality of their situation to sink in. All of their endeavors over the game have now been made moot as Arpeggio is in possession of every single clockwork part. It's as low a blow the team has been dealt since being separated all the way back in episode 3. Sly can't sit still, and Bentley draws up meaningless plans, but Murray is the one who takes their failure the hardest. This is due to the added consequence of the team van floating away. And while the game doesn't explicitly show us this, it can easily be inferred throughout the series that this van is Murray's pride and joy. And now he is losing it on top of the group's failure, and it's heart-wrenching. Who would have thought the best romantic development in this game would be Murray and his van? Not me, but hey, it packs a serious emotional punch. Episode 7 ends on a strong note and another big plot twist, which saves it from the mediocrity and artificial nature that was brought about from the idea of the Lumberjack games. The thing that sucks though for me is that Bassan is such an interesting character that I want to get to know more, but he ends up feeling wasted because we don't really interact with him at all in episodes 6 and 7, and our biggest exposure to him isn't even through a heist it's through some wannabe Olympic style games. He ends up being underutilized, and that's a shame because he has some real potential to be great. It's time for the game's conclusion in episode eight, Anatomy for Disaster. The gang takes some time to study up on Arpeggio, the leader of the Claw Gang. Much like Bentley, Arpeggio excelled in his mental capabilities but failed to ever grow physically into a strong specimen. This left him completely flightless, which inspired his obsession with building flying machines so that he could take revenge on those who bullied him. 
Needless to say, a mechanical engineer who is obsessed with building a flying machine will have a lot of use for the clockwork parts. This fact drives home a real sense of dread and sly, knowing that Arpeggio will be attempting to rebuild clockwork, the complete opposite of the gang's mission to destroy them all and rid the world of the evil bird. But with that, it's time for some recon. Entering Arpeggio's blimp, it's clear that the gang's hope is fading as clockwork has already been completely reassembled. Sly grabs some recon photos to try to decipher how close they are to bringing Clockwork back to life. Bentley picks up on some voices at the front of the blimp, and it's here where we have our final plot twist of the game. I can't believe it! She must have been working with Arpeggio all along! One that has been foreshadowed for quite a while. Nila and Arpeggio were orchestrating the events of the game from the background to ensure the bird would end up with all of the clockwork parts. In one of my personal favorite scenes of the game, Arpeggio lays out his plan, explaining that he seeks to mend himself into clockwork's frame to achieve immortality. In order to do this, he not only needs to reassemble the ancient bird, but also create a powerful source of hatred to fuel its immortality. Immortality! Immortality is what I seek! The other Claw Gang members were much too short-sighted. They were satisfied using the clockwork parts to drive their various trivial schemes. But not me. No, I saw them for what they really were. The keys to life eternal! All the pieces of the puzzle click into place, as Arpeggio explains that Rajan made the spice, Bassan distributed the spice, the Contessa devised a way to hypnotize those affected by spice, and Dimitri distributed spice across the nightclub patrons. The missing piece was the Northern Lights battery that contained enough light wave energy to hypnotize the entirety of Paris, and with that much hatred ready for absorption, Arpeggio would become immortal in Clockwork's body. Now there are some pretty obvious plot holes, like how in the world does Clockwork absorb hatred? Also, we drain the Northern Lights battery so this plan won't work. And also, why did Arpeggio allow Neela to go after the parts herself when it was clear that she was incapable of doing so without blowing her cover? But for the most part, it contextualizes and sums up the entirety of the story in a cohesive way, while also tying Arpeggio's plan to his motivation of being able to fly. Paris to unleash a hypnotic light show of hate. That's outlandishly cruel. Cruel, perhaps, but necessary to give Clockwork his spark of immortality. Ah well, my new body awaits me. Be a dear, Nina, and keep him covered. Ta-ta! And that's what makes it a great scene, up until Nila betrays Arpeggio and kills him off after entering Clockwork's body herself. The newly created Clock Club breaks free and sets a course for Paris to gain her own immortality. A lot of fans of the series have issue with Clock Club's existence, and I find myself being a part of that camp. While Arpeggio's actions are justified through his motivations, Nila's are not. What is Nila's purpose for getting into clockwork and gaining immortality? We're never really told. She just does it without any explanation or background as to why. She's a case of being evil for evil's sake, which is the most abysmal motivation a character can have in a story that takes itself somewhat seriously. She just does it because she's evil, and that's what evil people do. They want to live forever, and they want to rule the world, so that's what they do, and you just gotta accept it. And as a player, it just leaves you feeling like if Arpeggio was the one who got into the frame, it, this would have been such a better finale. This is the reason that a lot of fans, myself included, really rag on the name Clockla, because it's about a poor a name as the writing is bad. Clockla will fly around the map, reminding you of the looming threat as you complete the next set of jobs. The first is Charge TNT Run, where you must walk an explosive barrel around the map, collecting charges, and using it to blow up one of the blimp's engines. 
Clockla is drawing power from the four engines, and Bentley says destroying them may weaken her to the point that the gang can take her out. Of course, I'm pretty sure the blimp would crash if all the engines go offline, but okay Bentley, you're the genius here. This mission is more challenging than any of the other TNT runs because of the distance you have to travel, plus it can be kind of challenging to figure out how to reach higher elevations without jumping. Luckily, there is a checkpoint system. After each charge you collect, your progress is saved, so a mess up doesn't mean having to complete a run flawlessly. I want to wrap up my discussion on the presentation by talking about the graphics of Sly 2. The art design of the series has held up incredibly well, as all the animal characters look great and really breathe life into this world. It has an art style of its own, one that has become iconic for fans of the series. On the other hand though, there is a lot of pop-in textures and models that load as you get close, and you'll see a ton of it throughout every hub world, especially the latter ones. It's extremely noticeable when you're up on high vantage points where it's clear that half the level isn't fully loaded and rendered. That along with some visual glitches like Neela's arm going into her body or Sly's hat popping off during some Banakikam conversations persist as well. At the end of the day though, I can lend the developers some leniency considering that they had to conceptually evolve their level design, their story design, and gameplay design in just two years, which is a tall task for a small studio. Given that Sly 2 is so vastly different structurally from the first game, I can give the developers a pass for some of the issues, and that's mostly due to how strong the art design is. I love the design of the characters and of the worlds. The rest of our missions will see our characters pair up into duos to accomplish tasks, which is a good way of driving home the teamwork and brotherhood theme that this game pushes. These last three jobs, and Charge TNT Run as well, are final tests of all the skills you've learned over the course of your adventure. It's a victory lap of sorts for the main mechanics of our three heroes. This one starts off with Murray doing part one, where he needs to destroy security systems around the blimp, just like he did all the way back in episode one. Enemies spawn in, and Murray must deal with them while chucking objects at the security systems. From there, he pries open a door so that Sly can get in. The second part of this mission is then Sly-focused as he has to move toward the top part of the engine room in order to disable it. The first level contains a laser setup that tests the player's reflexes, while the upper part is almost a puzzle where you have to figure out where Sly can safely ninja spire jump. Maybe puzzle isn't the right word, once you figure out the pattern, it just becomes a waiting and execution game. Still, it's a new challenge we haven't faced yet, and with that complete, we shut down the second engine. Next, Sly and Bentley take a position to destroy another generator. First, Sly has to pickpocket some of the guards to gain access to the engine room. It's your fairly standard affair, but again, this is more of a victory lap for the mechanics. It's not meant to be brutally challenging. Nothing in the game is, like I've said. Except for this. From here, Bentley is free to enter the engine room, and I like his final set of challenges. He's asked to use his sleep darts as a projectile to destroy bulbs, but the catch is, if you don't break bulbs in pairs, you fail. It requires some accuracy and precision, which tests how good you've gotten with the crossbow throughout the game. The upper level of this engine room isn't that great though. You just use Bentley's bombs to blow up some power nodes to unlock access to the override switch. Throw it, and another engine is out of commission. Finally, we have our last tag team, Bentley and Murray working together. Bentley starts out by hacking into computers to unlock the last engine room. These hacking minigames have been some of the best parts of Sly 2. This set is no different. It introduces bouncing shots into Bentley's arsenal, but also adds in bulky turret drones that have a rapid fire feature. You can't take them on face to face, so your only chance is ricocheting shots off the wall to take them out. There's three variations on this, and they're all challenging in their own right. None more so than the final one, where you have to push forward and hold your ground against these same turrets that are now mobile. 
It's a true tug of war, and you can get overwhelmed and pushed back easily if you aren't careful. It requires lining up shots just right to finish off all the enemies at roughly the same time so that you can make that mad dash to the end successfully. Once inside the generator, Murray has to fight guards and lift the batteries up, only to slam them back down on the top floor. After how spectacular that final hacking minigame was, this doesn't really stand a chance at being memorable. I said it earlier, and I'll say it again, this game couldn't quite iron out enough mechanics for Murray to utilize. Before we kick off the last two jobs, I wanted to show you this pie chart, which is a breakdown for how many missions each of our three characters get, as well as ones where you control multiple characters in roles that carry meaning. As you can clearly see, Sly dominates the game as a whopping 52% of missions are played solely as him. This includes levels like Follow Dimitri, where only he is involved, as well as ones like Lighthouse Break-In, where every character shows up, but you only control Sly. It makes sense for the title character to get a lion's share of the playtime, but what surprises me most is how few missions Murray gets all to himself. Throughout the nearly 70 missions in the game, Murray only gets 9 to himself, and that's including ones like Rip Off the Ruby, where you started as Sly, as well as ones like Kidnap the General, which are completed in less than 1 or 2 minutes. The big guy clearly didn't get very much time to himself, and I think that reflects his mechanically boring skill set. And the co-op missions are somewhat inflated as a stat due to the seven operations we engage with because each of them contain different sections where we play as all the characters. What that means is that only five missions in the game see the crew working together in pulling off a task to set up the final heist, and that's a number I think should be higher. And finally, Bentley gets 12 missions of his own, only three higher than Murray, which makes sense given Bentley's role in the Jailbreak chapter versus Murray's. However, it certainly feels like we spend more time with Bentley than Murray, but that may be due to the fact that Bentley is always chatting with us during the Sly missions. But yeah, I just think it's interesting to look at data in this way, so yeah, that's the breakdown of mission distribution in Sly 2 Band of Thieves for your viewing pleasure. With the engines down, Clockla becomes vulnerable. Carmelita contacts Bentley somehow and says she's on her way with an attack helicopter, but she needs a tracker to reach their location. In order to do that, Sly must pull off one last job using a mega jump pack. This is the game's way of handing the player a power trip before the final job to wrap things up. With the pack, Sly can jump great distances into the air, which he needs in order to reach the apex of the four radio towers. It's fun to mess around with this thing, and it becomes an unlockable with a cheat code once you get 100% completion, which is a nice touch. Anyway, with this job completed, it's time to wrap this game story up by confronting Clockla. And unfortunately, the finale of Band of Thieves isn't the title's greatest moment. Carmelita arrives, because of course she has to be there, the game is ending after all, and we hop onto her chopper. It's then made abundantly clear that the fight with Clockla will be a complete rehash of the same fight from Sly 1, which is disappointing. I said in the previous video that, given the size difference, there probably wasn't a good way to allow for Sly and Clockwork to have a straight up fight, and that remains true here. The problem is that we're asked to engage with the clunky turret mechanics to fight against her. Clockla also doesn't talk during this exchange, it's just Carmelita yelling words of encouragement to Sly as he deals out more damage, and also belittling you if you fuck up. It ends up feeling pretty plain Jane for the final boss of a video game. Once we get her down to about 25% health, she makes an attempt on Bentley and Murray's lives. 
Sly must use his paraglider to reach her, and this section was always frustrating as both a child and an adult. It's very trial and error because the parts you have to glide to are constantly shifting, and one bad angle will see you fail and have to restart from the beginning. This makes me realize that missions involving just the paraglider mechanic actually regress across the game, starting strong and ending weak. You're gonna wipe out a lot, and having constant restarts is a quick way to destroy any momentum a climactic moment like this has. Luckily, I found a proxy spot and just launched myself way into the air, enabling me to cheese this section, which was great. We reach Clockla and whack her with our cane in the same way we did at the end of Sly 1. Get ready folks, because the real emotional impact of the finale is about to come at us full speed. Landing on the ground, the gang seizes their opportunity to destroy Clockwork and Neela for good. Murray pries open the mouth and Bentley blows the inner workings up with his bombs. It's here where we discover the hate chip, the one object tons of Sly fans find issue with but we'll talk about it in a moment. Let's get out of here! She's about to explode! Ah! My glasses! What? Bentley, I'll save you! <laughs> Sly, let's get out of here! Bentley is then crushed by Clockwork's locking jaw, and a stunned Murray works quickly to get him out. Murray carries Bentley off as he and Sly run to safety as Clockwork explodes and the final cutscene plays out. Carmelita arrives and her and Sly turn their attention to the hate chip. By crushing it, all of Clockwork's parts age instantly as his immortality is lost. It's kind of cheesy to just have one object that can destroy Clockwork, something that any of Sly's ancestors could have done at any point if they had known about it and found a way to access it. However, it doesn't really bother me too much. We do need a way to see Clockwork written off for good because it's clear his time has come and gone and final boss fights with him just don't end up being all that mechanically interesting. Carmelita then attempts to arrest the gang, but Sly offers to go peacefully if she lets his friends walk. It's evident that Murray and Bentley are beat up and that there will be serious consequences for the gang moving forward due to the events that have transpired. Sly and Carmelita share a plane ride to the police station where they spend time flirting with one another. It feels kind of forced and narrow given how little a role she plays throughout the story, and that's true even if you did play Sly 1. Eventually, Carmelita realizes just how much time has passed and Sly makes his escape and soars away to freedom after seeing that Murray and Bentley took out the pilot in order to give him a chance to escape. I'm not sure how this plane operated safely for two hours and completed a takeoff without a pilot, but we're gonna have to give it a pass. I'll be seeing you soon, Green Tail. With that, Sly 2 is officially over and the credits roll. I really like this ending because it sets up the possibility for another story without making this one feel incomplete. Clockwork's legacy is a little mishandled, but it's over and no Cooper will ever have to suffer from his wrath again. However, the gang is fractured. They completed their mission, but came out on the other side beaten and broken. Like a platoon of soldiers leaving for home, battered from the war, the members of the Cooper gang go their own way, and it's going to take a lot to bring them back together. But this video isn't done yet. I want to take some time to talk about the themes of the story, as well as how each individual character grows, and then we'll wrap up by looking at cheat codes and extras before I share my final thoughts. Now that the main story is complete, I want to spend some time discussing the overall narrative of Sly 2 Band of Thieves before transitioning into a more detailed look at the individual characters. 
It's clear to see that the developers wanted to expand their storytelling with the sequel, and so they decided to connect everything much more. Our characters have grown from the events of Sly 1, and the developers sought to explore how these characters could be challenged most. They did this by building three different groups that were all guided by various principles, with a wild card thrown into boot. You of course have the Cooper Gang themselves, who are antagonized both by the Claw Gang and Interpol throughout the game, with Neela being the wild card, who's able to play different roles and provide meaningful plot twists throughout. The story is well paced and full of highs and lows for our heroes. The first few missions go off without a hitch, but then half the gang ends up in prison, only to triumphantly return. From there, they pull off some more jobs until the big blow of losing all their progress hits before winning in the end, even if it does come at a serious cost. Now obviously this is a game designed for children and teenagers primarily, but that doesn't stop the story from having a theme, and for Sly 2, I'd say that theme is Brotherhood. This is a tale about a group of three who were brought together out of tragedy and learned to rely on and trust one another no matter what. When Sly and Murray are captured, the bonds of friendship are truly tested, as Bentley risks everything to save his friends. This is of course the major indicator of their bond, but there are other times throughout the game in which they save one another, like when Sly rescues Murray from Carmelita's capture, or when Murray rescues Bentley from Carmelita, or even when Murray jumps in to protect Sly from Rajan without hesitation. These guys don't turn their back on one another no matter how grim the odds are. They've learned to trust each other immensely, and it reflects in how they work as a team in perfect harmony. Most missions are completed by just one of the three characters, but there's always help provided and encouragement given through the Benakikam conversations. And of course, the final operations of each chapter see the group working together, depending on one another to complete their tasks so that everything can go off without issue. And when things do go wrong, they remain there for one another, unwilling to back down. They also have that distinct banter between one another that you'd come to expect from a group of friends. Just make sure to stay out of the fire. Get too close and old Grizzleface will be eating barbecued raccoon for dinner. By the game's conclusion, togetherness is what allows the Cooper gang to prevail. The perfect visual representation of this is when Sly, without hesitation, goes after Clockla when she steals his friends, and without this action, the two wouldn't have been there to finish Clockla off after their crash landing, so it reinforces that theme. The Cooper gang is constantly tested throughout the game, and they always come out on top because of the brotherhood that they form. I now want to look at some of the characters in depth and explore their arcs throughout the story. Some of them are pretty strong, while others aren't so robust. I'll be looking at the Claw Gang as one entity, and when compared to the Fiendish Five, I think they prevail in spades. The members here aren't as over the top as the Fiendish Five, but they're a much more cohesive unit. The Claw Gang though works together, and they have a master plan that requires each of them to do their part. Poor naive boy. My meticulous mind has found a way. As your hippopotamus friend will attest, spice consumption makes you both angry and susceptible to hypnosis. The Contessa, hypnotist extraordinaire, devised a way to command people through the use of flashing lights. I've created this blimp to be a massive transmitter of those precise light frequencies. The only problem I faced was finding a suitable source of light waves. The Northern Lights. You've been collecting Northern Light energy so you could hypnotize everyone beneath the blimp. Ah, hypnotize those who'd eaten food covered in illegal spice. Thank goodness for Dimitri. Through his nightclub, he got the whole city to consume the spice. It's an international criminal organization that has that master plan, which you have to have for good villain groups. Individually speaking, Dimitri is instantly the most iconic out of the five and would go on to appear in the third and fourth game. Despite being a bad guy, he's instantly likable for how out of touch he is and the way he speaks and just carries himself. He's charming. What is this with clocks, bro? Have you no vision? Are you 
hearing what I mean to you? You think you have juice? Don't show me a little mind when talking about such big things. You think you can swing the bat? Show your bling and let me shine you. Rajan is full of insecurity that he tries to cover up by hosting elaborate parties and lavishing himself and his surroundings with the riches he's attained. He gets poked and prodded by the gang throughout the story, and this eventually leads him to lash out, doubling down on his narcissism along the way. The Contessa is of course interesting because she is a double agent in Interpol while working alongside the Claw Gang. She's let her intelligence and ability go to her head though, and claims to be above morality, which we of course have to put her in her place. And finally, Jean Bassan is a man at a time and doesn't really get too much development, and the same goes for Arpeggio, which I think is a shame. These two characters were really behind the whole master plan, and they end up falling flat in the end. Inspector Carmelita Fox is perhaps the most underwhelming character from Sly 2, given how important she was in helping Sly at the end of the first game, not to mention the romantic kiss she shares with Sly that clearly gave her butterflies. At the beginning of this game, it's back to the status quo. Her feelings towards Sly are suppressed, and she's shoved to the side for Neela. She pops up throughout the story a few times, but never for anything that significant, other than being saved by Sly in Chapter 5, as well as the finale. Freeing her in Chapter 5 is contextualized well, but her showing up at the end seems totally random. I would have liked to see her take on a more intense role in this game. How it is now, she ends up feeling like an afterthought. Neela ends up providing a bang to the first half of the story, but her role tampers off and weakens as time goes by. She's able to weasel her way in and earn the Cooper gang's trust by helping them throughout the first couple of jobs. This makes her betrayal all the more hard to swallow, especially when she frames an honest cop like Carmelita to boot. This really ends up being the high point of her character though, as she just kind of goes commando and goes rogue for the rest of the story. Arpeggio allowing her to go after the clockwork parts herself is a concession to the story to allow her to appear in episodes 5 and 6, so it's not very meaningful. And by the finale, she ends up being totally one-dimensional, evil for the sake of evil, and it doesn't leave her feeling very memorable. Stupid Arpeggio. I double-crossed the Cooper gang, Interpol, and Carmelita. What made you think I wouldn't do the same to you? That brings us to the big three, Sly, Murray, and Bentley, who each overcome struggles throughout the main story to become stronger. Bentley is challenged to overcome his fear and anxiety about entering the field and completing jobs. At the beginning of the game, he's terrified to even go out on his own, but by episode 3, he's comfortable manipulating a foe as fearsome as Rajan. It shows a sense of courage which is then put to the test in episode 4 when he has to free his friends from jail. Seeing how ecstatic he is by the end of that episode, it's clear he passed the test. Murray isn't shoved to the side like he was in Sly 1 and is much more involved in this main story. His success in Sly 1 led him to bulk up and grow a sense of self and belonging through providing the muscle role for the group. The only thing that stinks is that most of his character development is from off screen. It takes place between these two games. But while he is the most underutilized character of the trio in this game, he still does get a few moments to shine, like taking on Rajan. And finally, there's Sly, who I'm happy to see faces actual struggles in this game that force him to adapt and rely on his friends. At the conclusion of Sly 1, our raccoon hero speaks about overcoming the imposing task of beating the Fiendish 5, yet at no point in the story is he seen to struggle, as if it was pretty much child's play for him. Here though, the Master Thief is pushed to his limits. He can't pull off every task himself like in the first game, and he fails a handful of times, none more so than his inability to see through Neela's game. Now, we're never really shown too much of his struggle with these failures, but I guess this is a children's video game, not an Oscar-winning story. Still, I would have loved to see a few moments, especially when he was locked in prison, to see how he was handling it. But overall, it's just nice to see him challenged more, while still remaining confident throughout. 
Before wrapping this thing up, I want to go over some of the extra features from Sly 2. There are a series of cheat codes that can be entered on the level select screen that do things like allow you to skip chapters or unlock extra gadgets and power-ups. These are pretty much relics of the past at this point, but cheat codes were pretty standard for PS2 games, and so I'm glad they included a few and I know I enjoyed them a lot back in the day. Just like in Sly 1, there are a series of hidden movies you can watch after completing the game. Unfortunately, in the remastered edition, only one of these movies is watchable, a short piece showing Sly and the gang stealing a rare stamp. I really hate that the remasters had to leave the other three on the cutting room floor, but there was probably a licensing issue that they couldn't get around. But if you do have the original game, you can go back and watch and you'll see that the next two hidden movies are actual commercials that ran on TV leading up to the release of the game. The best of which features Sly trying to flirt with an MTV personality named Lala. I'm not kidding, look this up, you'll crack up laughing, it's so bad. The final video though is a very insightful one that talks about the making of Sly 2. We get to hear the lead designer's words on how they wanted to evolve the series while also getting a taste of some of the behind the scenes work, like the creation of Sly's model, the level design itself, and some of the voice work being recorded in studio. It's a fascinating watch for fans of the series, and I'm glad they included it in the original release. I wish it hadn't been cut here, but unfortunately, it's nowhere to be found in the remaster. Sly 2 Band of Thieves contained an ambitious vision for taking the series in a more mature direction by expanding its gameplay and telling an exciting story with intrigue, betrayal, and companionship. In the 16 years since its release, the game's technical side has worn down. The art direction and visual style still remain strong, but pop-in textures and models, alongside of awkward facial animations, make it clear that building open hub worlds and revolutionizing the gameplay structure needed more than just a two-year window for development. Still, much of these performance issues can be forgiven when one considers just how much this game strived to accomplish when compared to its predecessor. The gameplay was completely overhauled without losing its core appeal, and additional mechanics and playable characters were introduced and expanded on throughout the adventure. The mission structure allowed for each job to fill a critical role in the overall objective of the chapter, which blended story and gameplay seamlessly. The narrative was also given an injection of life and contained a full three arc structure, and while it still remains fairly basic, it was a huge step up when compared to the first title. Sucker Punch was able to accomplish this incredible feat in just two years, which really shows how passionate the team was about taking what they had and pushing it from good to great. To be honest, this video ended up being more critical of the game than I initially thought, and I fear that my overall opinion on this game may have gotten lost along the way. Creating this massive video has taught me that I can see the flaws, even in my favorite games, but I truly think that this title is an example of the sum being greater than the parts. There's a lot to nitpick, but like I said, the developers earned a lot of leeway from the fact that this title was so ambitious and so different from their first outing. It was bigger and better in every way, and that's why even my harshest commentary on this game doesn't matter much to me on a personal level at the end of the day. Sly 2 Band of Thieves remains the pinnacle of the series for many fans, myself included, and it's a title I enjoy revisiting frequently to this day. It's my favorite game of all time for a reason, and while it's beginning to show its age, it remains a timeless classic to me. So that brings us to the end of another really long commentary on the Sly Cooper series. At some point down the road, I do intend to look at both Sly 3, and yes, even the ugly blemish that is, Sly 4. If you haven't seen the Sly 1 video yet, I'd say it's still worth it to go back and watch it. I was a lot harsher on that game than this one after all. If this is your first time watching something from my channel, allow me to show you what else I have on offer. 
Besides the Sly 1 video, I also have a 3 hour long critique of Pokemon Sword and Shield for you to check out. Both reviewing games and dissecting a single component of a game are some other projects I like to tackle here on the channel. And that would include videos like reviews of Jedi Fallen Order and The Outer Worlds, alongside of analysis videos like questioning the design of Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, as well as the features of Dreams that help the game form community. I also have a long-running series called Psychology of Gaming, where I take a look at how psychological principles are worked into games, and how games can affect us psychologically. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I'd love for you to subscribe and check out some of that stuff. Projects like this take a month and sometimes two to make, and it always feels rewarding when the videos do well, especially as a very small YouTuber. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you completed this whole video. Really, thank you, I appreciate it. Please leave a like if you enjoyed it, consider subscribing for more, follow me on Twitter at NoteNapNarp for future updates, and as always, have a nice day, and take care.